is the Cam Baker Show. Seeking answers to age-old questions. Deciphering the world painted around you by the mainstream media. This is the Kev Baker Show. And now, here is your host, Kev Baker. Good morning, good afternoon, evening, whatever you see. A big, huge, massive, warm welcome to this. The first Kev Baker Show of the week, right here on your number one network. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you tonight, 49 in the chat so far, and all the extra thousands out there listening live, and the ones who will listen on the stream later on after the show. It really does, it pleases myself and Marty no end to see you all coming back, and tonight we really have lined up one of the most special shows to date. And I say that because this is really a guilty pleasure of mine too. How many times have we spoke about CERN on this show? It's too often to count. So, tonight, I've managed to find and unearth one of the better guests I've heard speaking on this subject, and we'll get to him in just a moment. Now, if you were listening to Jai D. Moore's show during the... Just had to cut that there. If you are listening to Jai D. Moore's show during the day today, you'll realise that this isn't just a one-hour show like normal on the Kev Baker show tonight. No, 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 no. To give this guest ample time to present his information, what we're going to do is we're going to roll on over into Joe Joseph's show. So tonight we're going to have a bit of a transatlantic truth special right here on a Monday, Marty. And are you looking forward to this one half as much as I am? Yeah, absolutely looking forward to this one, guys. I know we have been talking about CERN a lot really over the past couple of months, but I do find it of utmost importance. Um, is uh, definitely something that we should get into. Definitely, and with the recent German Wings disaster, it put it front and foremost on the Kev Baker Show. And Joe Joseph, welcome to the Kev Baker Show tonight. It's something that you too have been looking at in great depth for some time. The CERN. It's, fre- it's Freaky Friday on a Monday. It's almost as if like, CERN's like fired up and we're in an alternate universe already. I mean... What a bonus. This is this is fantastic. And uh, our guest tonight, Anthony Patch, he's just one of those guys that have done just an absolute plethora of research. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but let me tell you something. I just can't wait to get into this because there's so many different factors in play here. You know, there's so many different things at work. And so we can dissect them all tonight because we'll have plenty of time to go through it all, which mm-hmm. is great. Exactly. So like I was saying to the listeners, this show will be running on over into Joe's. We'll take the second hour and then if need be, Tony will stay on for a third hour just to wrap up anything. So we're not pushed for time, folks. So we've been speaking about Mr. Anthony Patch. want to welcome him onto the show. Anthony's an author of several books and he describes himself as a hobbyist monk when it comes to topics like science and CERN. So, Tony, welcome at long last to the Kev Baker Show. Well, thank you, Kev, and, and Joe, and Martin later on. Uh, I'm going to call this Monk Monday. <laughs> Monk Monday it is. Monk Monday works for us. And, Tony, you know, I had absolute pleasure listening to your first show with Clyde Lewis on Ground Zero. I think it was maybe just up to a fortnight ago at the most. And that's where I first was exposed to your work. And I must admit, you talk about CERN being a rabbit hole. Some of the stuff that you've wrote and you've sent me and some of your research, you're about to take us down the biggest ultimate rabbit hole tonight that is CERN, man. (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, As as we know, we need to kind of keep our sense of humor about this thing. It is big, it's bad, and it's evil. But I think we also need to know who's in control, and that's where I take my humor from. Well, Tony, tell us a bit about yourself. Let's find out who it is that's going to be telling us about CERN tonight. And how did you end up falling into this darkest and deepest of subjects? <laughs> well, I think I took the real trip down the rabbit hole about four years ago. But I've been studying and following CERN for over 20 years. I think the first time I encountered it was in a popular science magazine. And I was captivated by the machinery, the technology, just the the massive 
undertaking that they had going. But really about four years ago, I began to understand the evil hidden agenda that was associated with this. And that's when I, in earnest, dug into the scientific papers and the journals and everything that I speak of and that I write comes from the pure science end of things. And I try my best to translate and sum up and paraphrase for the rest of our audience to be able to understand, which is really kind of an arcane, esoteric area of our lives, which is science. And Tony, you're not steeped in this academia. You don't come out with all this jargon. You're like us. You're basically just a normal guy who has, like I said at the top of the show there, a hobby. And that's what's led you to this. And I find that maybe that's why you are so effective, that breaking down all of this hard science and making it understandable for the common man. Yeah, I, I, um, it's, it's funny. I, I didn't realize that I call it a talent or an ability or whatever, but um, I didn't really understand it until I started writing. And I realized I was translating, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's thoroughly uh, captivating to dig into the science and see what's going on and then be able to make some sense of it for the rest of us. Well, I'm halfway through one of your books just now, and it's 2048, Diamonds in the Rough. And I must tell the listeners out there, visit Anthony's site. It's anthonypatch.com. I'll drop a link in the chat room, and I'll put it in the description on YouTube as well so everyone can go and visit it. But I was blown away by the fact that, again, this is the use of fiction, Tony, to get across some really hard factual points. And I love it. I'm fascinated. I can hardly stop. It's just trying to find the time in this ever-quickening world to actually spend time reading stuff. Yeah. Definitely. It's hard, and that's the benefit of a program like you guys. You you can take this information and put it out there in rapid fashion because things are moving along quickly, and they're going to continue to increase in their speed and their their, uh, rapidity. I don't know about you, Tony, but it seems to me as if things have definitely picked up and speeded up since 2012. Now, I don't know if there's any tie-in with CERN, what we're going to be looking at tonight, but nobody can argue that things definitely seem to be getting quicker and more interesting by the day. Now then, CERN. How did this place come into being, Tony? We've heard that it was responsible for the birth of the internet, but when did they actually take Mm -hmm. up this atom-smashing craze that they now are partaking in? What led them to that? Well, this came out of the Cold War. In the United States, we had the Manhattan Project, which resulted in the atomic bombs. And part of the agenda with atomic weaponry was the SALT Treaty, and which was a strategic arms limitation treaty. And it became apparent that computer modeling of more and more powerful nuclear explosions in the form of warheads, but inside a computer rather than detonating them below ground or above ground, that that modeling needed to take place. So that really, in the mid-50s, is where the ground was broken in CERN, uh, Switzerland, and really became the process of modeling nuclear explosions for the military-industrial complex to develop more um, efficient warheads. So that's you and taking us that back moved, to the 50s, Tony, and you're talking about basically virtual battlefields. I mean, we hear about how far behind we are technologically compared to the military mm-hmm. industrial complex, but I don't think anyone appreciates that they were playing with virtual battlefields and computers back at the 50s or even thinking about that. That's very true, very true. And you raise a real good point, and that is that the technology that we see in the mainstream today truly is just the tip of the iceberg of what has been under development for over 50 years. There's a lot of you know, machinery, so to speak, that we're not even aware of right now. So do you think there's any chance that maybe, just maybe, some of this machinery isn't exactly new on this earth? Could it be almost off-world, ancient tech rediscovered? Yes, I think if we follow along the uh, the line of thinking of the fallen angels spoken of in Scripture and in other 
uh, Babylonian and, and Sumerian writings that perhaps there was technology that came from um, mm-hmm. the fallen angels or ancestors from the stars or if you want to call them ETs that was presented to one of the classic cases, of course, is uh, the Nazi technology, that their rapid advancements during World War II have been attributed to this handing down of technology. And certainly, I think CERN is representative of a lot of, let's call it forbidden technology that has been passed on to mankind. And you know, as we progress through this show tonight, we're probably going to revisit this because we're going to be going into the more occult aspects of CERN and what the kind of darker agenda may be why they're actually trying to produce these black holes and strangelets and smashing things at the speed of light. All of this will be covered as we go on. But let's just deal with this actual atom smasher just now in CERN. Now, Tony, you're saying there that they came up with this idea, they've built this thing, and we spoke often enough on here about how they're smashing atoms and they've got the chance of creating black holes And it's okay saying that, but what is it they are actually doing? What is this process all about? Can you describe to us what is going on underground at CERN? Yeah, in a nutshell, and we can get deeper into this, but they're producing two beams of subatomic particles, protons, that are circulating in a ring that's about 27 kilometers in in, uh, circumference. They're circulating these beams, they're accelerating them to 99.99% the speed of light, and then they're colliding them. They're actually two beams going around in opposite directions that they will cross over. And when the crossover takes place, the beams will collide, and they'll fracture out, and they'll generate massive amounts of energy from those collisions And from that, they will analyze those particles and those energies to determine what subatomic particles were contained within those collisions that took place. And we're told how when it reaches its peak, they're going to be smashing things at 14 terravolts. Now, it's impossible for any of us host listeners to even try and imagine that. The best way, I think, to try and picture it is if we take it down to something we we can understand. If you think of two vehicles traveling in opposite directions at seven miles per hour, when those two vehicles head on crash, what do you get? You get that collision, you get things flying off, and that combined speeds of the two sevens would give you that 14. Now, Tony, is that a good, fair way of explaining it in layman's terms? Yeah, most definitely. Um, To be a little more complex, the tera electron volts, TEVs, tera stands for trillion. So we're talking about 14 trillion electron volts. And it's hard to put that into, you know, something you can relate to like a light bulb or lighting up a city or something like that. But really what we're talking about is just a very short burst of energy that also results in the increase in mass, and that's a little more complex, but you're seeing particles that not only generate energy, they're also increasing the mass of particles at the same time. And that somewhat violates the standard model of the universe, and we can get into that much later. But yeah, that's a fair analysis of two cars colliding and generating um, energy spinning off from that collision in the form of electron volts. And one of these exotic particles that the physicists dreamt up at one point was this Higgs boson. Now, we've all heard of this one, folks, but before we get there, Tony, I've always been told in physics, standard model, closer you get to the speed of light, the more mass will increase exponentially. I'm struggling to get my head around how they're firing these protons at such high speeds, so close to that speed of light, and yet they're containing these things in that chamber that is stretching for 17 miles underground at CERN. Have I got a wrong idea of what happens as we approach the speed of light? Do we all have that No, that's, idea? Very, that's very perceptive of you, my friend, because very, very few people, when they talk about CERN, 
have picked up on that one little bit, and that is that as you approach the threshold of the speed of light, a particle cannot exceed the speed of light. Everybody has heard that, but the part they haven't heard is that the more energy that you put behind the acceleration of that particle to try to reach that threshold, that particle actually increases in mass and it will increase as much as 14,000 times its what's called rest mass or original mass before acceleration. So you are looking at particles of incredible mass or density, if you like, that are then colliding at nearly the speed of light. So very good. You hit a real critical point. Well, we've got this Higgs boson thing, like I mentioned there, the God particle. Firstly, Tony, have they even found it? Does it even exist? Well, in terms of mathematically, it was predicted way back in the early 90s, in fact. And it wasn't until they experimentally, in the form of colliding particles that they were able to say, yes, we found it. But the process of finding the particle really is the result of, in this case, six to eight months of data analysis. And there's an incredible amount of data in terms of trajectories and energies from the spinning off of particles that is collected by the detectors in the machine. And all of that data has to be analyzed to determine um, things like spin and angles of momentum, to determine what type of particles that they're actually detecting. And to put it in perspective, it takes about 4 billion collisions of, part of protons to result in about a dozen Higgs boson even being realized in these waterfalls of data that are generated and then analyzed. So at the end of a six to eight month process, they came up with their final figure of 85 to 90 percent probability, not certainty, but probability that they found the Higgs boson. But mainstream media will just gloss that over and say, oh, they found it. So whoopee, we did our thing. And you're on about data analysis there. And I think that probably sums up the work that, or it would describe the work that the likes of myself, Martin, Joe, hosts in the alternative media. What we do is we analyze data. And one data point that I need to correct for the listeners, because I always like to go back and correct any disinfo, misinfo that we put out. And I was startled today, Tony, to find out that it wasn't Homer Simpson that predicted the mass of the Higgs boson. Do you want to tell the audience about that little piece of propaganda that the mainstream put out there? <laughs> yeah, you got that from my presentation. I, I love it. I, I, I hate it when I've put out wrong information, but in this instance, I think it's quite comical. Well, in 1998, there was a, um, an episode of The Simpsons when Homer theoretically came up with the formula to describe the weight, the, the mass energy equivalency weight of the Higgs boson. And so the formula that you saw in the photo I sent to you represents his prediction. Again, this is mathematically, not experimentally. And he was only off by about 600 and... 61 giga electron volts. Now, giga electron volts represents the mass of the Higgs boson. So he was only off, let's say, by a few hundred giga electron volts. The reason this came about is a gentleman who was a staff writer for the for the program for the Simpsons is a mathematician, and he's written a book a book about the math of the Simpsons series and it turns out that there are quite a few staff writers that are actually mathematicians so there's a rabbit hole right there for you and one interesting piece just to round off the homer simpson stuff when you actually worked out the equation it was tony that was pointing out that it works out to 777 now in numerology obviously the occultists and that is something we are going to be going into as the show goes on that's a very relevant number Indeed. And it was only last year we had Christine Lagarde from the IMF reminding us just how important the number seven is to people who know how numerology works. 
So then, away from that, back to CERN. Now, we were dealing with this Higgs particle, Tony. Now, that, that makes up part of the Higgs field. Could you describe to the listeners what the Higgs field is and what it basically means, how it orders everything that we allegedly see around us just now? Yeah, and again, we're speaking and reflecting what the scientists are putting out, which is theoretical hypotheses about the universe from the Big Bang to the makeup of the universe. It is all theoretical because we're standing on a little marble in the universe trying to figure out what the rest of the universe is doing and what it's made of. But if we follow the lines of the Big Bang, the Higgs field is essentially what comprises dark matter and dark energy. And to kind of drill down and give you a picture, the Higgs field is much like a matrix. And I know that's the name of a movie, but think of it as a fabric of space, a woven fabric. And moving through the, the woven spaces of the Higgs field are what are known as weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. And the Higgs boson is considered one of these particles that makes, moves through the Higgs field. As it moves through the fabric, it actually slows down. And as it slows down, it will gain in mass, which is counterintuitive to what we just described taking place within the Large Hadron Collider. But again, it's the fabric of space. It's where the quantum particles live and breathe and move. And that's what they intend to literally tear apart and rip the veil, which is the Higgs field, in our universe. I've always speculated, and it is pure conjecture and speculation on my part, that during the first round of these experiments, Tony, could it be that they almost went away and redone the maths? Because when they fired it up that first time, possibly they didn't have the power levels correct. Maybe they couldn't maintain a stable opening, a stable rift into this or through this Higgs field. Do you think I'm way out in the realms of the twilight zone there? Nope, you're actually right on track. That's an excellent question. You've done your homework, I can tell. Yeah, I did tell you I was a right CERN buff. I do apologize to the <laughs> listeners out there. I do. I know. I'm so sad. No, it's cool. We're in the same camp. Maybe we're in the same rowboat without a paddle. I don't know. <laughs> and you know, as we go on, we were even talking today off air about how maybe you were destined to end up doing this kind of thing, Tony. But just to lay out the basics in this first section, that's what I'm trying to do for yeah. listeners here. Now, we were obviously told on the 24th, or yes, I believe it was the 24th of March, that there was a short circuit that had occurred on the 21st of March. Now, obviously this coincides with this German Wings disaster, Tony, and this takes me to the first show I heard you and Clyde on. Now, I'm going to ask you to enter the realms of the woo, as we call it here on the Kev Baker Show, into the freaky stuff. Do you think there could be any correlation between what is going on in Geneva, under the Alps, and what happened above ground, with the German Wings Airbus flight? I will speak hypothetically with just pure conjecture on my part. Um, I have no way of proving anything that I'm going to say, and it's just connecting some dots. There's two things. Um, Clyde Lewis from Ground Zero, whom I was on with, was speaking about gravimetric waves, essentially gravity waves moving through the crust of the Earth. And he'd run across some um, research and some theories indicating that in places like the Alps, where this uh, German Wings aircraft went down, there were detected at the time of the crash gravimetric waves moving through the Alps. Now, could that possibly have magnetically affected the avionics, the controls and instruments of the aircraft? I cannot say that it would or would not. I will, however, qualify it a little bit and say, why would it affect only one aircraft when there were many, including other Airbuses, in the area? And so it was quite selective, and gravimetric waves are not selective. So I'm going to say that CERN at this point, with respect to their magnets, 
creating gravimetric waves moving through the Alps did not have any correlation to this crash. However, and we'll get into this a little bit deeper later on, but CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, has the ability to be a directed energy and a kinetic energy weapon. And was a directed or kinetic energy weapon used on this aircraft? I don't know. You see, that's the, quite fascinating because we're almost at the break, Tony. And I just okay. want to leave the listeners with this thought. Now, I don't know if many of you have heard of Judy Wood and her theory about 9-11 and the fact that maybe directed energy weapons were used on that occasion. Well, folks, on Google, Brookhaven Labs. And you tell me, is that close enough to be a directed energy weapon on 9-11? Just something to consider, and we'll be back after these short messages. You're now tuned into the Truth Frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Half of tonight's Kev Baker show with me, your host, Kev Baker. And I've got my usual sparring partner and co-host, Big Marty. He's on tonight. Joe Joseph, he's still here tonight. And yes, I have hijacked my own show. But that's because... <laughs> I've been so looking forward to this guest. And you are so the science guy, dude. So, I mean, you're the perfect guy to set this all up, which is which is what's awesome. So, yeah, right. Marty and I are kicking back here. Don't worry. Don't, Don't worry. worry. I will I will let you loose. Very we will get in there. I am now, all ears, brother. I was mentioning 2012 to the listeners and how me personally, Tony, I think time has almost speeded up since then. Now, We've seen CERN going through that first raft of experiments when they were collating all this data, looking for that Higgs particle. And then it shut down for two years. What was that all about, Tony? Well, they determined that they had maxed out the power of the machine. And when I say that, I'm speaking specifically about the magnets that are used to confine the particle beams that are circulating around the ring. And... There was an indication that they had achieved the ability to momentarily open a portal, an interdimensional portal, as well as the production of strangelets particles, which we'll get into strangelets in a few minutes. There's a threshold of 10 TeV as compared to the 7 TeV that they supposedly achieved and then shut the machine down in 2012. They actually briefly reached 10 TeV. To put that in perspective, right now they're moving towards September where they will achieve, like we said, 14 TeV. And Tony, the reason I believe 10 TeV is quite relevant, relevant, isn't it? Because one of the colliders I've spoke about on the basis of your information was the RIC, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. Now at 10 TeV, they actually produced one of these strangelets, didn't they? Yes, yeah, small quantities of strangelets were produced, and this is right out of a science journal published in August of last year. And when we're talking about strangelets, let's give them the really cool name of quark gluon concentrate. That's basically what we're looking at, isn't it? That's right, concentrate or a condensate. But yes, it's two um, components, quarks and gluons, that move together and form a artificial um, particle called a strangelet, and there's three major characteristics that we'll go over in a little bit, but essentially these predate t in the timeline of the Big Bang, these occurred prior to the Higgs boson. So these actually were there before the Big Bang? They were the moment after the Big Bang, and if you're looking, for example, in a, in a flow chart moving out horizontally from left to right you have the moment of the big bang to the left the next moment are strangelets being produced the quark gluon condensate and then the next moment in time is the formation of the Higgs boson and other bosons and, and quarks and it's these things called strangelets that has people that I hold in really high esteem like Stephen Hawkins people like that really really worried now, the worry is, folks, that they could produce one of these things and we could be talking about the Earth basically falling in on itself. And that's not me being dramatic, Tony, is it? Because if these strangelets are produced, 
they would fall into the centre of the planet and basically collapse everything in on itself. Am I right? Yes, most definitely. That's one of the three principal characteristics of strangelets. And I call them the cousin to black holes because they are made like... Uh, micro black holes they're created at that threshold of 10 tera electron volts and the change going back to 2012 for a moment the change that occurred was because magnets that they had up to 2012 could only briefly reach that threshold of 10 TeV to make strangelets now they've spent two years installing a different type of uh, group of magnets made of niobium and titanium and they will then be able to achieve 14 TeV as we said I'll stop here but yeah we'll come back in just a second here after your comment about the earth collapsing and some of the other characteristics so where do you want to go now Tony because I don't know if we're still on this why they shut down or will we go for the strangelets aspect but when we're talking about these strangelets it's almost as if the scientists said that this might be some kind of sub-product of the experiments they're doing. The more I look at it, I actually think this is one of the main reasons they've actually built this thing. What do you think? Yeah, I know that there's been quite a bit of cover-up going on with CERN regarding the production of strangelets. CERN, the, the people there will deny it vehemently. They'll talk about them as being cork gluon condensates, but they will not speak of their characteristics that you and I are speaking of today. So let's go back to the fact that it, they can fall to the center of the earth. They can, because they're so heavy, they, like a black hole, they will penetrate through the floor of the detector at, in, in the Large Hadron Collider. They will anyone, penetrate. See, just to set this up, Tony, for people out there who might be struggling to think, well, how could this make its way through all that rock and everything else down to the core of the planet? Well, you have to look at other experiments where you've got people looking for things called neutrinos. Now, they go deep, deep underground to try and basically separate them from all the background noise, and right. they fall right through the planet, Joe. So when you're dealing with this kind of subatomic quantum world, things are not, they don't work the way that we think they should work at times. And if you remember in the movie 2012, it was the neutrinos that were heating up the core and causing all the, all the havoc and chaos. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And they're akin to neutrinos in those characteristics of being able to pass right through solid matter without really even slowing down. And neutrinos are generated in the Large Hadron Collider artificially, but they do occur naturally here in the cosmos and go right through our bodies and right through the Earth all the time. Unbelievable, Kev, you know. And, and that's the thing is, you know, it's it's the height of human arrogance that that says... Well, you know, we're doing this, and by God, we know how to, we know what we're doing. Right? We're scientists, damn it. But to <laughs> me, I mean, they're screwing with some pretty high-powered, dangerous stuff here, you know? Awesome. Almost akin, almost akin uh, Anthony, to, uh, uh, you know, the first nuclear experiment and the 50% chance that we're going to ignite the atmosphere on fire and destroy all life on Earth. Yeah, they had a betting pool on whether it would ignite the atmosphere or not. Just well, unbelievable. If we have produced these strangelets then, Tony, and one of them is down there doing its thing, what kind of signs can we look out for on Earth? How would we know mm -hmm. that this is even happening? Well, it, it is my uh, conclusion, based upon the report that I cited that came out of the RHIC at Brookhaven in August, that back in April of last year they produced a small quantity of strangelets, and they were very proud of it. And if that is the case, there is no vessel that can contain those. Therefore, you can extrapolate that to say that strangelets are now at the center of the Earth, and their characteristic, beside being able to penetrate the Earth like a neutrino, is that they are stable. They attract unstable matter, which is virtually everything else. Everything you see and interact with on a daily basis is actually unstable matter. A strangelet is stable. Therefore, it attracts unstable atoms, starting with quantum particles, but then attracting atoms and then molecules to them. And exponentially, they grow. 
and they attract more and more material to them. In the case of a neutron star, as an example, this is how a neutron star is created. You could therefore say, theoretically, that the Earth has already begun the process of conversion to a neutron star, and it is my conjecture or connecting that that's why we're seeing the increase in volcanoes and earthquakes taking place. Definitely nobody can dispute the fact that when you look at the frequency of the earthquakes and the volcanoes, I know there's people out there say that's just down to better reporting and better technology these days. I don't think so. I think things definitely are picking up, Joe. And these changes that could hint at some kind of anomaly been down there in the centre of the Earth. We don't have to look very hard to find these volcanoes, earthquakes, strange things going on. And absolutely, and and we're seeing an uptick of it. You know, at the same time, uh, you know, from a cosmic standpoint, things are changing cosmically as well. So mm-hmm. there's a lot. There is a lot in play here. CERN being, you know, to to me, CERN seems to me to be more of a. Oh gosh, it's got a science side. It's got a um, it's got a spiritual side to it as well, and we'll get into that definitely in hour number two. You know the the consequence of opening these gateways and and interdimensional portals and black holes open up a whole host of possibilities that I don't think either they haven't factored in because they don't believe it themselves or they do believe it and they're just so damn arrogant and they think they can control it. And one other really? thing I think that they might be exploring with this, and this is just purely because of the fact that, you know I like to explore modern culture and TV shows, Joe. Right now, one of the biggest ones is 12 Monkeys. Now, this involves time travelers coming back from the future to fix a problem in the here and now. But the interesting thing here, Tony, and I'll send you a picture and I'll put a picture in the chat room as well. The actual device that they are using, it's a Hadron collider-like machine. It's basically just a miniature CERN. It probably looks like the one that they've got at Brookhaven Labs. And Mm. I just wonder if there's any kind of manipulation in the time field. Are they trying to, dare I say it, spark up a time machine? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And we'll get into things like the electric universe. We'll talk about um, wormholes and quantum time field changes and things like that. Because most definitely... When you're talking about the type of magnetic energy that is generated as well as the energy that results from the collisions, you cannot help but distort time because you're tearing into the fabric of space. And, you know, it's NASA, I believe. They've launched the MMS-4 satellite mission. And I believe that's the magnetic Mm -hmm. multi-scale experiment. And what they're doing is they're actually watching the effects on the magnetic field. Tony, are they not? They are, because it, when the magnets are powered up, they are most definitely affecting the magnetosphere and the magnetopause. They call it the shape or morphology of it that they're changing. And this is going to lead into Saturn and some other things that we're going to talk about in a minute. But those four satellites are arranged in a diamond formation over the Earth, and they are there as updated versions of pre existing satellites that have been watching the microscopic micro black holes that naturally occur when gamma rays coming from the universe, from the cosmos, from a black hole, when they burst forth from a burster, gamma rays are directed towards the Earth, and when they enter our magnetosphere, they cause black holes to be formed. Now, these black holes are microscopic, and they only last for less than a nanosecond, but... This is what the MMS is looking for, are the creation of black holes as a result of the activities with the Large Hadron Collider. And I believe they won't even fire this CERN up when there's CMEs firing off. Is that true? Yeah, it causes um, quite a bit of distortion within the detectors. You, You need to appreciate, and I'm sure you do, but the audience needs to appreciate that the atmosphere, if you will, within the detector when a collision occurs needs to be as clean as possible and it needs to be as free of electromagnetic interference such as would result from energy coming from the sun in the form of flares, coronal mass ejections and 
those distortions of our mag- magnetosphere that occur and the energies penetrating those shields would reach the earth and therefore reach the environment of the detector and basically would distort all of the data that's coming out of these collisions that they're trying to analyze. So it's a matter of interference. Ah, Joel, Joel, Joel. You know, it's in, it's interesting, Kev, because and Anthony, because uh, I've seen, and I can't remember where I've seen it, but when they fired up CERN, and they have those satellites that are looking at the magnetic field of the Earth, and they fire it up, and boom, it just, you can see the magnetic field just get all kerfluffled, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, yeah, so with that said, you know, if you do it at the same time a CME is inbound, the Earth is basically defenseless, at yeah. least as far as I can tell, I mean, or, or compromised. And Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I would think it would it would cause a whole host of other problems as well, Anthony. It definitely does, and um, there are also people that are that are very sensitive, you know, people we would call sensitives, who are able to sense when CERN is powered up and operating. Um, this is also contributes to the effect upon the animals that we have seen. We've seen the mass die-offs that occur when we have. Um, CMEs from the sun coming through and penetrating the shields, and if CERN is dropping the shields or opening, you know, gaps in the in the shields, then most definitely we're going to have animals and people affected by that, and many people psychologically are affected. You know, this is something they must know. Though. They must be monitoring all of this. It must be like HARP. There must be so many different projects and aspects to this, Tony, that basically... We're probably only scratching the surface of what's going on at CERN, to be honest with you. Oh, definitely. I'm only scratching the surface because I'm only reading what is, you know, public information. There's quite a bit going on there that I have to use my own discernment and my own conjecture and, you know, my imagination to try to determine what they're doing. And later on, we'll get into where my imagination took me to Saturn. Definitely, that is going to be absolutely fascinating. Oh, That's why we're taking yes. this first part, Joe, to basically lay it out, the science of it. Now, one of the things that I've seen in your recent presentation, Tony, that I have to ask you about is the fact that possibly, this isn't the first time we've had such things as particle colliders on Earth, and I'm talking about maybe some of the hieroglyphs from back in Sumeria and stuff like that, and also talk of the stuff like the Tower of Babel. Do you think this is the first time round when it comes to atom smashing here on Earth? No, this is at least the second time, and you're right on track with that. I think in the ancient times, um, the knowledge that was used and the techniques employed were much more along the lines of what we would consider to be spiritual rather than the technological. Physics certainly played a, a role but I think that we were looking at things that were more related to um, the spiritual realm and the ability to manipulate using the power of spiritual entities, manipulate time and space and the physics. And portals were opened in the ancient days. And we see in the Sanskrit writings, we see in the Babylonian um, carving, stone carvings, representations of devices and machines that look identical to the detectors and the particle accelerators within the Large Hadron Collider as well as smaller colliders around the planet. So definitely we're seeing uh, a deja vu moment, if you will, but in in a more scientific approach rather than a spiritual approach to opening portals and the other aspects of their agenda. And you know, it might sound a bit woo, a bit out there, but when you think of the Egyptians and the fact they used to speak of going on journeys into the underworld and stuff like this and using almost like boats to traverse this underworld makes you wonder joe what they were actually talking about and you know you know i'm not a religious man per se but it seems to me that there really is nothing new on earth everything has happened before it's all absolutely absolutely and you don't need to be first of all i'm not religious either i'm spiritual there's a difference you know you can be religious about a lot of things you know um, the spiritual, uh, that, that takes on a whole new meaning. And also it, it, once you, once you come to grips with the power that spirituality holds, then you can start to understand 
the power that exists and how, you know, you, you can put it in your head as far as how it used to be wielded in those times, you know, when spirituality was much more powerful and, mm-hmm. and people were much more connected. Uh, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm sure one of the pivotal reasons why God was removed and there's been such a, a push to remove God from society is because they know that that is the only way, the only way that they're going to be defeated, I guess you can say, is through that spirituality. And, um, and what they're trying to do, I mean, this is CERN and devices like it, there's nothing but bad. I mean, they, they have, they've got some good... Co- One of the good things about CERN, uh, Anthony, that came up, I, I just recently saw it on a documentary, was that they figured out that based on mathematical calculations that the universe is not random, it is ordered. Mm-hmm. That's one, one thing that came out. And I found that fascinating because um, that should be, to me, proof enough that there's something higher that a higher power, a higher level of consciousness, a creative force, God, whatever you want to call it, based on your own individual belief, it shows that it's just not some random things. It's not, uh, you know, uh, these molecules that just all of a sudden cleave together or, or that human beings came from a little pool of slime to eventually come out and become what we are today. It, it all kind of ties together. So, you know, I guess the silver lining in the cloud with CERN is that, yeah, that was one thing to come out was that, hey, the universe is not random. It's ordered. And, but you're and right. I'm in agreement with you. I'm a believer. I'm a born-again Christian. And I am not a prophet, but I will tell you in all due humbleness that I have been led to a lot of things that I had no clue about, had no interest in, but have been shown to me, and it's loud and clear, and I know that this is all part of God's grand design. I like to say that God has a great sense of humor. Um, I think he laughs at the hubris of these um, folks that are involved in this. I hold no ill will towards anyone involved with CERN, but truly this machine has led some people to realize that there is a divine creator and a divine order to all things. And I believe, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I do believe that Dr. Stephen Hawking, in his most recent um, concerns about the creation of black holes and what the power that's being generated represents at the Large Hadron Collider, that he as well is coming around to the fact that it was God that ordered this universe. And Tony, we actually spoke off air just before the show about the problem of finding some grand unified theory. It's quite hard to marry up the big picture, like the planets and everything else, and then get them to work with the same math as the quantum world that we're talking about tonight. And I'm just wondering, if you you call it God or religion or source or whatever it is that ordered all of this, I think these scientists have to find a way of marrying that spiritual aspect to the science before they can hope hope to even achieve the grand unified theory. I agree. And when we talk about the standard model, we're talking about the gravitational model of the universe. And the desire to come up with a grand unified theory is to go back and be able to prove that the Big Bang is the accurate representation of how everything started. And yet... Citing another physicist, Mr. Dr. Albert Einstein, he even said in his later years that he got it wrong, that he left out the electric component and focused only initially upon the gravitational model of the universe. And he said at the end of his life that if we had included the electrical aspects, the plasma we're going to talk about later, the electrical aspects of the universe along with the gravitational model, then possibly we could come up with a grand unified theory, gravity and electricity being merged to explain the universe, its behavior and its constructs. And yet he died before he could do that, and he also didn't have the benefit of quantum computers. And Tony, it might seem like the more far out there part of your research, this whole Saturn 
electric universe aspect that we're going to go into in the second half of the show. But to be quite honest with you, when I watched this today and I was listening to it, it actually resonated very, very well with me. And it actually added to what I thought was going on at CERN in the first place. And when we look at the dark occultists that are up to some nefarious antics with that machine, then it all starts to make sense, really. Right down to the fact they're using things like 666 for a logo and Shiva dancing the the, the death dance out the front of the building. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's like Captain Obvious strikes again, Anthony, you know? Yeah. And and they're being very obvious now because they're so far along in their agenda. They know that really there there's no one or group that can stop them. Um, I think God's going to interfere at some point in this grand scheme. But let's go back to talking about Babylonia, um, the Sumerians, going back to the discussion of you know spiritual in the old days, in the ancient times. We're going to get into talking about Saturn and the electric universe, but I really want to emphasize the fact that things were vastly different, both physically and spiritually, for man in the ancient times. You're absolutely right. I don't want to get too far into that because uh, we're we're up against a break, Anthony, but we will get into that on the other side. What a place to leave the audience. Just Oh, yeah, and, you know, uh, coming up in hour number two, Kev, I also want to play a clip uh, from uh, Professor John Lennox of uh, Oxford University as he talks about the limitations of science and why it's so important to understand the spiritual aspect. It kind of sets all that up. And then to get Mm. into the ancient, you know, pre-flood world and what that was like. the times of Noah. I heard Anthony saying that today during his presentation and I immediately (sighs) thought, you know, a big shout out to Jai D. Moore in the chat. His show, Red Pill Report, 4 p.m. in the UK, and that's 8 a.m. on the West Coast of America. Guys, if you didn't hear that show today, please, please, please go and download the archive. Guy D was talking all about internet security, and do not, under any circumstances, download the Bible app. Go and check out Guy D's show, and we'll be back right after these short messages. Do not go anywhere. Just getting going. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> Fighting for humanity and against globalism, one mind at a time. It's the Freedom Link with Joe Joseph. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Freedom Link this 6th of April, 2015. I'm Joe Joseph, along with Johnny King and Kev Baker. And if you haven't been listening... Hour number one. Yes, it's Freaky Friday on a Monday. That's right. Special edition with our very special guest, author and researcher Anthony Patch. You might have heard him on Clyde Lewis, uh, but he's been on numerous, numerous interviews, and he's written some great books on topics ranging from the Large Hadron Collider to everything to Saturn via the Large Hadron Collider, nanotech, transhumanism, quantum computing, AI, all of the good stuff. I mean, this is this is what we talk about. And and the nice thing too is that there's a spiritual understanding here too, which kind of blends all of it in because you can't really understand all of this unless you understand it in its entirety. And to do that, you really need to look at the spiritual spiritual aspect as well. And to me, that seems to be a limitation. The limitations of of science is that you know uh, back in the day. Uh, you know, people like Copernicus and Galileo, they were, they were spiritual men and they understood and, and basically science glorified the creator to them. And the more that they learned, the more that they were just like, wow, it's awesome. Wow. This, this creation. Well, uh, before we get to Anthony, I want to play a little clip to kind of set our number two in motion. And this is somebody that I've been, uh, uh, talking with back and forth and also um just he has a great way of getting the message across as far as the limitations of science so it's a quick little two-minute clip this is uh, professor john lennox of oxford university well one of the best ways i think of seeing the limitations of science is to imagine a lady whom i'll call my aunt matilda who's baked a beautiful cake and she's displaying it to the nobel 
science prize winners of the world and asks them, I ask them as the master of ceremonies, I suppose, to analyze the cake. And of course, the chemist will reduce it to elements and the physicist to elementary particles and so on. And we get a brilliant description of it. And then finally, I say to them now, thank you for these scientific descriptions. I've just got one last question. Why did she make the cake? And of course, the physicist can analyze it, but the physicist clearly will not be able to tell me why she made the cake. In fact, no scientist will unless she reveals it to me. Now, the interesting thing about that is this, that when she reveals it and tells me it was made for her cousin Fred or something like this, that doesn't shut my reason off. I use my reason to see if her explanation makes sense. Now, of course, that raises very deep questions. It raises the question as to whether there is a something or better a someone who stands in the same relationship to the universe as Aunt Matilda does to the cake and whether he has revealed anything. And of course, the basic Christian claim is that's precisely what has happened, that God who made the universe has revealed something. And that little illustration may be simple, but it helps to explain another misapprehension that's very widespread, that revelation, that is in terms of the Bible revealing things, is somehow against reason. That's nonsense. We use reason in all areas, even in understanding revelation. The point is there are different sources of information. One of them is the study of nature. And the other is, as I believe, uh, the book of God's word. And when God reveals something in his word, we don't shut our reason. In fact, we need a reason even to read it. But then we can see if what is said makes sense. And so that would be the approach to the question of the limits of science that I would take. So that's, that's basically uh, uh, Professor John Lennox's explanation as to the limitations of science. And I, I, I take it to be just that, Anthony, in that, if you leave out the spiritual side of things, you're really doing a big disservice because you're missing a key critical component of this whole thing. Most definitely, and that was a great summation and example. And that's where the ancients were more connected to the spiritual aspect of the manipulation of the universe. And you cannot separate your thoughts from your environment. You cannot separate what you do in your mind from what happens to your environment around it. There's the theory that we live in a holographic universe. Well, what's to say that we aren't projecting from our own minds holographic representations of what we believe to be our surrounding environment? No, very much. And very well said, too, you know. Joe, That's I've the thing, always is worried it? about if they pierce this veil at CERN, what happens if they're looking through into the other side and they see another equal set of scientists waving at them going, no, turn it off. <laughs> you know, this could be, this could have horrible yeah. implications. We're recreating a big bang. Now, in my mind, the best way to do that is to have another big bang. And Tony's been telling us about how basically we are now on course to become a neutron star. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable, man. <laughs> it's like the uh, script of a bad X-Files film. But Johnny King, you know, when we talk about, like, uh, mathematical precision of the universe, um, if it happened any faster or any slower, we wouldn't be here right now. No, it was – it had to be absolutely precise. If it would have – I think it's a, a billionth of a percent slower, the universe would have collapsed. If it would have been a billionth of a percent faster, the universe would have exploded. I mean, Not that's right. interesting. Uh, that, and it, that that Anthony seems to be just more evidence that you know there's more to this than just the scientific or analytical aspect of it. I would agree, and I think what you guys are referring to is there was a recent article that just came out. I forget the name of the physicist, but he was talking about um, chaos theory and that we're living on the ragged edge of balance and imbalance, chaos and 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 order. And it doesn't take much to put us, push us over that precipitous edge into chaos or into destruction. So you're exactly right. There is definitely a divine order to everything. 
And I think we as individuals who become aware of this information can have an influence through our own prayers and our own spirituality as to what's going on with CERN and what's going to happen with our planet. Now, just um, just a little uh, background, and Kev can relate to this too, because uh, we've been going through hell here lately, it just mm-hmm. seems. Well, Tony mentioned the fact that some people are maybe more sensitive. More to- sensitive to this stuff, right. That's Thanks. what I'm saying, Tony. I mean, I can't believe, um, well, let me just say, I have never put two and two together before in this regard, but how playing with devices like CERN, and I don't think people understand just how powerful that device is, um, can it wreak such havoc, not just on the human body, but also the human um, psyche, mm-hmm. uh, your spiritual connections, everything. And, and the other thing that's interesting, too, is, you know, and maybe you can talk to this a little bit, is really we don't see a whole lot of existence We see a very small portion of it, but things like CERN expose so much more of that reality that we don't see. Isn't that right? That's right. I think if we take a step back and look at the big picture of what's going on and objectively say, suppose we were watching the X-Files, we were watching a movie or reading a book in which this whole machine and its agenda and all the people and the money were part of this storyline you would look at that and go well that's you know pretty remarkable creative whatever but boy i'm glad that's not happening in our reality well the shock is it is happening in this reality (laughs) and what are they really doing and you have to say when has human history shown us virtually every country coming together massive amounts of money and technology and the brightest people in the world all pulled together for one purpose. It's not to find the God particle. I think right. people have to really accept that cold, hard truth that there is a lot more going on because we can see a lot going on. Absolutely. And John King, you know, uh, I just recently read that it cost the cost to power CERN up. pounds a second. A thousand pounds a second. Is what they said. Sure, and that's just for the accelerator portion of it. Right, exactly. A thousand pounds, meaning like not dollars, John, pounds. A thousand pounds. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. A thousand pounds of BS. Yes. Well, no, but I mean, that's to to invest that much as far as resources into it. It seems to me that that's that's a pretty heavy endeavor. To find yeah, a Higgs to, boson particle. They're trying to accomplish a whole lot more. And I go into this in my books, but just very quickly, let's just say there are a dozen different agenda, ranging from transhumanism to DNA manipulation to the opening of portals, the production of strangelets and black holes, to communing with other spirits in other dimensions, to reaching out to Saturn, to wanting to kill God. Okay, how's that for a list of agenda items? Pretty ambitious. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, and 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 that's that's an unbelievable reality. Is that these these people, these architects of CERN? Because you you look at when CERN was first developed, um, the the father of the of the atom bomb was part of it. John King, you know, one of the masterminds. Go ahead. No, we're looking at, you know, Oppenheimer and and Teller and all of these guys. And that all started at Berkeley, my alma mater. That started at the radiation lab at Berkeley. And there's a synchrotron particle accelerator there now that's called the Advanced Light Source Building. And that's tied to Livermore, which is just a half-hour drive from Berkeley. And that's the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory where fusion reactors are located and all kinds of neat stuff. That's my backyard. That's where I grew up. Those are the people I associated with. Wow. That's unbelievable. That's, a, that, that's an unbelievable uh, group of people there. John King, you got something to add? Yeah, they don't have to build that much uh, to kill a god. Killing a god is, is fairly easy. There are ancient texts written about how to do such things rather than to build that thing and end up destroying the universe. Well, yeah, yeah of course. I mean, th- the... 
if there's one thing I've learned from the powers that shouldn't be, Anthony, it's that um, A, they're ambitious, and B, their plans are always multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Always multifaceted, and that, I mean, it's just unbelievable that the things that go on in our society today that are unleashed by them are always, they always have more than one purpose. I've never yeah. seen it where they just come out with something that has a singular purpose. Absolutely. Right down the line. You're exactly right. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Now, um, as far as CERN itself, you said, you know, one of the things that, um, or one of the purposes is something akin to an, interna an, an international, geez, an interdimensional um, portal yes. or a wormhole. Or uh, th Now, those are distinctly different things, though, are they not? They are. One's a gateway. The other one is a traveling a, a mechanism for travel. So a wormhole is something that you can use to move in a quantum entangled fashion or what they're talking about today, supersymmetry, to be able to either move through to another area of the universe or to interact through a wormhole with another area of the universe. And supersymmetry very quickly just means that if I observe or interact with a particle in this world, our dimension that we relate to, that there's an equal par particle in another dimension that is responding identically, simultaneously to the stimuli or the observation that I'm making with the particle here. And Tony, did Einstein not even describe that kind of thing as spooky action at a distance? Mm -hmm. Basically, Absolutely. he couldn't really, he couldn't fathom it at all, but he knew it existed. Right. He was using his mind much like we use um, quantum computers today. The man was absolutely incredible in his ability to model in his mind mathematically and, and write the formulas in his mind what it was that his imagination was telling him. You see, that's and what I yes. would do. If they do manage to get time technology going, I would go and I'd pick him up, I'd get Tesla, I'd bring them back to just now, and I bet you the two of them would just spend the first week shaking their heads at what they're using some of the science for. I think the first thing Tesla would say is, you stole my ideas. <laughs> Very good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, now that, that guy was, uh, let me tell you something, talk about a brilliant mind. Also talk about, you know, how we've seen these brilliant minds get snuffed out really easily, especially over time. You know, one of the things that here in America, Tony, is uh, the dumbing down of America. We've seen it big time. Yeah. Um, and as a result of, you know, our public education system and the fact that uh, children these days are subject to a prison culture and they get USDA stamped on their ass and sent through the uh, down the assembly line to be good little drones, it snuffs out their creativities instead of having the next Nikola Tesla on your hands because you didn't focus on the strong points. Oh, man, look at this kid. Wow, he's super intelligent when it comes to math. So let's give it to him, you know, math, 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 okay. math, math. Let's go, go, go with that and, you know, give him the basics of the other stuff. But, man, go math intensive. Because of that, we've really stifled that, that creativity mm -hmm. and that ability to really take it to the next level. You're and right. it's it's sad to see where we've come in such a short period of time, but it's also revealing in another way because where are they getting this information from to be able to come up with these particle accelerators, number one, and number two, to understand the spiritual side of it as well. Where do you think that comes from? Okay. Well, let's go back to Tesla to take sort of your part B of that statement. Very well said. Tesla, in his later years, went to the dark side. He admitted that openly, that he was communing with dark spirits, and he was getting the information so quickly in his lucid dreaming that he couldn't write it down fast enough. And so he, in comparison to Einstein, Einstein was much more of a, let's just call it a believer in God. He was much more of a believer um, than going to the dark side as Tesla did, and much of what Tesla derived was from the dark side, that carries over into the present day, not only in the sense that they stole his technology and built it out into a larger format, but they are still continuing to commune with the darker forces, as did Tesla, 
Therefore, they're getting the information from those other realms, and those are the realms that they wish to tap into by opening a permanent portal for that continual communing with those dark spirits for more information. And this goes to the big picture, believing the original lie put forth by Lucifer, who became Satan in the Garden of Eden, that you you shall be as gods, you shall live it forever, hence transhumanism, DNA manipulation, and we're going to talk about Saturn in a little bit. Oh, fantastic. It's funny, you know, that you mentioned that because I've been reading a lot of the extra biblical texts lately, the stuff not in the Bible specifically, but one thing that's fascinating is the book of Adam and Eve because the book of Adam and Eve kind of gets in, into all the grade area that, that the, you know, between... What you see in Genesis and, you know, basically between then and when Adam dies, and even then it gets into the lineage a little bit. But, um, but one of the things that's interesting that people don't understand and something that's described in the book of Adam and Eve is, you know, there was a, there was a war in heaven and a third of the angels were cast out along with Satan and banished to earth. It was a punishment. To, and they banished them to earth. Then Adam and Eve fell. And they were banished to Earth. So to me, Earth seems to be, at least in my eyes, based on my research, a prison planet. Uh, and if you're a believer, as I am, you suffer horribly with that once you come to the realization, like, damn. <laughs> and you understand who's really running the roost over on, on planet Earth. And, of course, all you got to do is look around you. You can see, uh, you know, whose spirit yeah. prevails on this planet right now. Um so, yep. you know, so it, it, it all kind of came together in that regard. But the other thing is that before uh, Adam and Eve became flesh, they were angelic beings. They were interdimensional beings. They were created in God's image. That's one thing that people don't understand. People say, well, God created us man in his own image. Well, at first he did when, <laughs> when we weren't uh, these an well, made of animal flesh. Right. You know, but before that, Adam and Eve saw into the angelic realms, into the different dimensions. They could see all that. And when they, when they were cast out of the garden, which I believe, you know, based on the reading that I found, isn't exactly in this material realm, this three-dimensional realm that we live in, that there was more to it than that. But when they fell and that was taken away from them, imagine being able to see into these different realms of existence, into these different dimensions, and then having it ripped away from you. And so what happens in, in, in the book of Adam and Eve? They continually commit suicide. And God's having to bring them up, raise them up. He said, you know, and, and God spoke the word and raised Adam again. And Adam jumped off a mountain. <laughs> and then, okay, time to raise him up again. So, uh, I mean, it is just a fascinating story. But it all shows, you know, that, look, there is so much more to this existence than what you see and what you experience. And if they believe it, you should believe it because they're using it for them, Anthony, you know, and, and that's the thing right. to advance their agenda. If people want evidence that there is an occult agenda and occult um, motivating factor to what's going on at CERN beyond all of the wonderful physics and machinery that they have. Look at the dances that they did recently. They had a, a video they put out called um, Symmetry. They have um, put on an opera, so to speak, inside the machine itself, inside the Large Hadron Collider. They are doing rituals at CERN that are purely occult in origin. So they know that they are spiritual power. They know that they are worshiping other spirits and they're getting information from them. And they know that those spirits are there to help them achieve Satan's goal, which is in the final analysis, um, opening portal and you know wormholes and everything else, the final analysis is Satan wants to kill God and he needs an army to do it. So I'll stop Absolutely. there. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. That that's that's a a great way to look at it. Or you know, better yet, look at the people now uh, today that are pushing, you know, this agenda. They want to become gods of their own. You know, here they are 
pushing for immortality. Uh, we can get into transhumanism too, because that's a that's a great topic that you speak often on. Well, Joe, I've seen it described once that these futurists, like of Eric Pianka and Kurzweil and all these kind of guys, they not only think they're at a level now where they can take on God, they think if it was a one-on-one -on -one fight, they could trump his creation. That's the <laughs> level these people are thinking. That's the hubris they show. It's yep. arrogance. It's total and complete arrogance. I mean, ugh. It, it, that's yep. the thing. Think about this for a second. Here you have a God that spoke into existence everything, you know, from the Big Bang on. Uh, if Now, if these guys can go ahead and do that, go ahead, try it. I, I, I'd like to see it. Personally, I think you're going to see a little intervention before that happens. Kind of like, you know, that drunk, that, that drunk friend that you got that just can't control himself and is drinking a half gallon of vodka a day. What do you do? You hold an intervention. Why? Because you love him. What do you think God's going to do? You think he's going to just let it go on ad infinitum? No. This is his creation. He still loves his creation. And he's going to have an intervention, just like we would. It's the same exact thing, Tony. That's right. And, you know, from just a machinery standpoint, the, the Hadron Collider is very fragile. We saw the supposed, you know, interruption last week because of a small piece of debris causing a short circuit. That's a cover story, and I won't go down that, you know, tangent. But the whole thing is it wouldn't take much more than about a 4.0 earthquake over there at CERN to shut that whole thing down permanently. So, yeah, God can intervene anytime he wants. All he's got sure. to do is breathe on that thing. <laughs> you know, I'm That's... having a few thoughts here, Joe. You know how my mind works. I jump, yeah. cut you all off. But you are talking about a prison planet, and we're looking earlier on about the fact that possibly, just possibly CERN could be viewed as a weapon. Now, I'm wondering if something with 10 or 100,000 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field I'm just wondering if that's going to be enough to punch a hole in that Van Allen radiation belt, something that NASA just recently admitted again that us humans can't get through yet. So although there could be interdimensional aspects to everything that's going on there, maybe we're looking at a more physical application to this as well. Again, yeah, very just, good. just a thought very to good me. Point. Yeah, it is, a, it is a very good point. And uh, boy, we're running up against a break, but this conversation is just fantastic folks and you want to stay tuned uh to the other uh, on the other side of the break as we get into more of the spirituality we'll get into the electric universe how saturn <laughs> plays into all this i'll bet you it won't be the saturn that you think it is but we'll get into that as well because again there's so much more to this and also uh some pre-flood talk oh yeah because you know if i'm involved we got to get into as was in the days of Noah. So we will indeed right here on the Freedom Link on Truth Frequency Radio. TruthFrequencyRadio.com will be right back. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Joe Joseph here. You're listening to the CERN Link. We've decided to go away from the Freedom Link. And we'll, we'll, we're, tonight we're calling it the CERN Link. Or better yet for this segment the saturn link to sir Ooh, yes i'd also like to invite everybody at uh at uh, 6 p.m pacific 9 p.m eastern to join mike pachesney and Kristan t harris for the rundown live and then following uh mike and Kristan is phoenix rising radio with phoenix himself so just an awesome night of radio ahead and of course our very special guest is anthony patch uh, you can check out his website, anthonypatch.com. Go there today. Check out the books that he writes and especially the, the, the subjects that he gets into. It's just awesome. I mean, you, months of reading. I mean, all this research, actually years. <laughs> it takes a long time to get this. But we're talking about, you know, the spiritual component of uh, the Large Hadron Collider or CERN. And Anthony, uh, you were bringing up Saturn. How does Saturn play into the Large Hadron Collider? Well... It's interesting. I had looked at the physics of what CERN was capable of doing externally as a machine. What could it do? What could it project? And I also looked at some of the mystical aspects of our universe and the ancient beliefs and cultures. And I made the leap in my head that CERN's going to connect to Saturn. And then I started to look more into 
perhaps there were some pre-existing theories that would back up my thoughts. And I found out I was not very original in my thoughts. There is a website I'd like to direct you to. It's called um, the Thunderbolts Project dot com thunderboltsproject.com they deal with the theory of the electric universe and specifically plasma electric plasma connections between heavenly bodies like planets and stars and they showed me as I was reading that site that my conjecture was right spot on the money and that doesn't make me special it just means I'm imaginative and the long and short of it is CERN will connect to the southern pole of Saturn. And I'll let you jump in. Whoa, Marty, help me out here, man. My brain started leaking out onto the floor again. Yeah, I absolutely thought. I wonder if there's some significance to the actual location of CERN and where it is based and the constellation of the planets and the stars. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's the answer to it, is some sort of connection to Saturn, some sort of portal, maybe using the energies. Would you say that, Anthony? Yes, indeed. Um, when we go back to the ancients, we look at the pyramids, we look at the Giza pyramids, and all of the conjecture that they being um, directed at energy weapons, sources of energy, generate, uh, energy collectors as well as generators, so if we look at the pyramids and carry that over to CERN, CERN is a modern version of a pyramid. And essentially I'll I'll get to it, but I want you to interrupt me if I if I you know going too quickly, but we are looking at a plasma conduit, electrical plasma conduit being created at CERN and projected at the southern pole of Saturn. And I'll tell you why that's going to occur but we can go into the physics if you want for a moment. Now, just before we go into that, Tony, there was a question in the chat earlier on, and now's a good time to get it in here. And it's something that I think we've all thought about as well, but none of us have really dug into, and that's whether the location of CERN may well be on top of some of these naturally occurring ley lines that we're talking about. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, definitely. It sits right on top of a ley line. There is a magnetic... Um, confluence or connection or meeting of ley lines at CERN. And that goes back to our discussion with the aircraft crash and gravimetric waves occurring at the same time. I don't think they were connected, but it does indicate that there are gravimetric waves that correspond to the ley lines. And it was not by you know accident that they s selected that location could they be uh, trying the to even, like, charge up this natural energy grid, Tony? Could they be trying to do something on that aspect? Yes, they will definitely tap into the naturally occurring magnetic energy of the planet through the ley lines to boost the energy that they are using within the collider itself to make that connection between the Earth and Saturn. And I'll give you the history on Earth and Saturn and its proximity in just a moment. Well, that's just what I was going to say there, because a lot of people might be thinking, well, how are you managing to tie Saturn to CERN? A lot of speculation here. But having watched your presentation today, I've got the advantage of that. Some of the cave art and the ancient hieroglyphs, they were basically hinting at this electrical model to the universe that we are kind of talking about here just now. Mm-hmm. It, in the ancient times, and we're talking about pre-flood, we're talking about pre-Babylonian, pre-Sumerian, going way back, Saturn actually was closer to Earth than it is now. And our environment, including the atmosphere, the density of it, um, the electromagnetic energy, the gravity of Earth was vastly different at the time when Saturn was very close to the Earth. There was an actual plasma conduit connection between Saturn and the surface of the Earth back in the ancient times, there were, was a planetary alignment that existed. If you picture Earth and then looking up into the sky, the first thing you will see very close to the planet is Mars. And right behind Mars in alignment is Venus. And then beyond that is Saturn. 
Yeah, excuse me, not Venus. Um, yes, I may be wrong. It may be Venus or Jupiter. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me, but just off oh, the okay. top of my head, um, we do have the connection or the alignment of the three planets in close proximity, so close to the Earth that you now have the sun blotted out by Saturn and only the rim of the sun around Saturn itself being visible at various times of the day and night. And you see that depicted in, like I was saying, this ancient cave art, the ancient pictures from Egypt. And this is obviously something they were aware of, Tony, but how were they aware of this knowledge? Where did they get it from? Uh, this has been handed down, and we hear things about secret societies, the Masons, the Illuminati, whatnot. But essentially, we're talking about information that's handed down through generation after generation in a secret society that has this information in terms of how to use the spiritual that was used back when Saturn was closer to um, Earth. And there was a direct communion going on between Saturn and Earth. And it is my understanding that we are a prison planet, but so is Saturn. And we're Saturn, told that Saturn's just this gas giant. What would be mm -hmm. the relevance of some wormhole or some portal to the hexagon on Saturn? What would be the relevance of that? Well, Saturn is a gaseous body, but the, the hexagonal shape that you see at the north pole of Saturn is a synchrotron particle accelerator, naturally occurring particle accelerator. It is exactly what CERN is, but that's at the North Pole. And extending to the Southern Pole, where you have a spiral rather than a hexagonal shape, you are seeing at the Southern Pole, the southern end of Birkeland currents. There is a hexagonal plasma conduit that extends through the core and to the Southern Pole of Saturn. And those Birkeland currents are energy plasmas that consisted of two charges in a twisted or helical fashion surrounded by um, rings or energies of magnetic energy. And you know, Tony, I'm wondering, it's just hitting me right now as we're saying this, you're talking about twisted things and rings. Can people cast their mind back to the Norway spiral? I wonder if they were trying to create some kind of connection with that portal on Saturn using technology there. Pure speculation, of course. But this Saturn, mm -hmm. what in your opinion then, why do these occultists hold Saturn in such high esteem? What is it about that planet in mm -hmm. particular? Excellent question. I believe that Saturn holds the entities that were cast from heaven and imprisoned in the heavens, so to speak, imprisoned in Saturn itself. I believe that it, too, is a prison planet. And the reason for making the connection is to bring those entities, those spirits, back to Earth in the form of Satan's army in which he's going to employ that army in his battle against God. And does this work two ways? Is this like a telephone? We hear Kurzweil and all these futurists, the transhumanists, talking about uploading themselves, their consciousness, getting out of here. We've been talking about how this planet could well be turning into a neutron star, Tony. Are they looking to almost create a new world, somewhere they can go, somewhere their consciousness can travel to? Yeah, in the popular culture, Kurzweil and, the, and those folks, much like the movie Transcendence, um, talk about uploading their minds, their spirits, their entities, if you will, into a computer. And it goes beyond uploading into a computer. Um, that's for the popular culture, my, mainstream media. What they want to do is ascend to a higher plane of existence in which they believe that they can open this portal, that they will, they've been promised, this is the deception, that they will ascend as spiritual entities, that their bodies will no longer be their bodies. They will turn into spiritual gods and ascend into a different dimension, into a different plane of existence, leaving behind the planet itself. They don't care what happens to the planet, whether it's a neutron star or Fukushima 
or earthquakes and volcanoes, they don't care because they have bought into the lie that they're going to leave this place. And, you know, this is where we can take it really one step further, but it's not going X-Files and fiction. This is real stuff we're talking about. And, Tony, you were alerting me to the fact that there's, apart from the CERN Collider, there's something called the ALS at Berkeley. Now, they were a part of the Genome Project, you were explaining to me, and I'm wondering if them looking at DNA and stuff like this is all part of this quest to well, you know it has transfer to this information because basically that's all DNA is. It's raw code. And are they trying to transfer that across this? Yes. There you go. Yes. Um, CERN is involved, again, multiple layers and facets and agenda items at CERN. They're involved in DNA manipulation. They are involved in what is called the third strand of DNA. The purpose... if. I'm, I'm jumping around, but let's go back to the ALS, the Advanced Light Source Building. is a synchrotron particle accelerator at UC Berkeley. Mm, much were, like Saturn. Much exactly like Saturn. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the North Pole of Saturn, it looks just like the synchrotron at Berkeley or in Jordan, which is called the Sesame Ex- Accelerator, Open Sesame. Okay. Um, Brookhaven is the same thing, a, a ring-based um, particle accelerator. Berkeley wow. was Berkeley uses their synchrotron for a lot of things, but one of the things they do is generate the brightest light in the universe. This is not a visible light. This is X-ray energy, X-ray light, that then comes off of the accelerator in the form of beam lines. These beam lines, these tubes, terminate in different experiments. One of the experiments is to look at the actual structure of DNA, look at the proteins, look at the proteins and be able to create computer-aided design models in a computer, three-dimensional representations of the proteins, what they call protein folding, and then be able to print physical models using a 3D printer of these proteins. The whole purpose of doing that is to understand the building blocks of DNA, create an artificial third strand of DNA, which is then used to grow a new entity, to grow a new person, a new body. Hybrids is the result of the growth using third strand DNA. One of the reasons for the hybrids is to accept these spiritual energies from Saturn to indwell these bodies. The other part of this whole issue with third strand DNA is to create a single person, the beast, the image of the beast, and I'll stop there. Uh You see, that's why I kind of brought that up, Joe. I'm wondering if this beast kind of thing, is that what they're trying to bring back through it's, CERN? And remember, CERN could be short for Sir Nunos, the well, horned if you, god. If, well, I'm, I was just, I'm so glad you brought that up. There's a, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot that goes into CERN, good grief. But one of the interesting things in Enoch, Enoch talks about how the black holes are the prisons of... Uh, you know, that's that's where God casts all the into black holes, into these uh, abysses, if you will. So, the, the, all the fallen angels they got they got thrown into these black holes. So, what what are they doing? You know, who are they letting out and unleashing? You also have to remember that time isn't. You know, they say, well, it's only open for a nanosecond. Yeah, but a nanosecond is probably an eternity to a being that where time doesn't have any relevance to it. You know what I mean? So yep. that's there you the go. other thing. And, and I would encourage our audience to try to wrap their head around the, the concept that we have to have a paradigm shift. We have to take ourselves out of our present way of looking at our existence and understand the spiritual aspect being just as equally as tangible and realistic and relevant as anything that's in your world that you can touch. And that's the thing that CERN understands. The people working there, they understand you cannot separate the two. The spiritual and the physical are one and the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. As a matter of fact, let me get into that real quick. Uh, one of our hosts here at Truth Frequency Radio is a guy by the name of Rob Skiba. And oh, I know Rob very well. Yeah, Rob is a good friend of ours. And uh, believe it or not, like we grew up 20 minutes from each other, never met each other. <laughs> <laughs> with one of those things. And uh, and he wrote a great piece on his Babylon Rising 
blog uh, on CERN and basically tying it into, you know, the Saturn thing. And he says, believe it or not, there's a character in the ancient Wiccan mythology named CERN. What is also interesting about this particular myth is how, yet again, it also seems to have direct ties to Nimrod and the many other myths associated with him. For instance, there's a character in the Wiccan mythology called Lupricus. In the myth, he's known as the Great Golden Wolf. He was born on the night of the winter solstice, <clears throat> December 25th. Imagine that. And uh, something else that Rob found particularly interesting about um, the Lupercalia Festival that was uh, celebrated in ancient Rome uh, about February 15th. Uh, and by the way, that's the myth where we get the imagery of Romulus and Remus nursing from a wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Well, the thing that he found interesting about the Lupercalia fe Festival is that it also seemed to be directly associated with Pan. And as we've learned uh, many times over, he goes over this all, uh, just all the time. It says Yeshua made a point of showing this particular god of shepherds who the real shepherd was. Well, like Pan, Lupercus was thought of as a god of shepherds. In fact, Lupercus and Pan are often thought to have been one and the same. Now, if Lupercus is indeed another form of Nimrod, he says he finds this very intriguing. But regardless, it's truly amazing how all of these myths are tied together and how the God of the Bible constantly steps in to set the record straight. And the Wiccan myth goes on to state that Lupercus was given 12 labors to perform in order to prove himself worthy, similar to that of Thor and Hercules and Gilgamesh. And these labors are what sends the su this son through the signs of the Zodiac in one year. Success, uh, succeeding at the labors, he was proclaimed as a sun god. So once again, we see that this god's exactly the same uh, and everything else. Now, that this, here's a, he continues, he says, that the story of Lupercus is really another culture's version of essentially the myth of Osiris becomes even more obvious as it progresses. And on Easter, the spring equinox, while out hunting, he gets struck by lightning and he dies. And so he becomes the god of the underworld, just like Osiris. The only thing that remained of Lupercus was his wolf skin, which was found by another hunter. And um, that hunter, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to skip back and forth here. Uh, Esau, the hunter, rushed up like lightning, killed Nimrod, uh, Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Then he took the valuable garment of Nimrod after he killed him. It's a total match. Uh, and then he gets into, but here's where the story gets interesting. He says, after Lupercus goes into the other wor underworld, his brother CERN decides to usurp Lupercus's earthly throne as the ruler of this world. Now, although in this myth, CERN is the brother of Lupercus, we see a similarity between Lupercus as Nimrod or Osiris and Cern as Tammuz and Horus. And at least, in, he says, in my mind, absolutely connects Cern with the Illuminati. But to show mm -hmm. just, how, just how connected Cern is with the occult, he says that, you know, you've got to find the link between Lupercus or Cern and Saturn. And it says Saturn and Lupercus seem to have a lot in common, especially when it comes to feasts. The Saturnalia feast of the winter solstice, which later became known as Christmas, seems to closely seems to be closely related to the Lupercalia feast uh, through the carnival season. Likewise, there appears to be really strong ties between CERN here on Earth and the planet Saturn and the Hindu gods, which may put the statue of Shiva into greater perspective. What's your thoughts on that? I, I am in total agreement with him. I'm chuckling because um, he's really put it all together. And yes, it is Mars and Jupiter and Saturn that are in alignment. And Jupiter, it figures heavily in the old myths and the old gods. He's exactly correct. And the thing that just really makes me laugh are people who do not want to look at the old ancient myths and the old gods because there's a physical crossover to the myths and the gods themselves. And oh, yeah. that comes back to the electric universe because many of the manifestations and the stories and myths were actually what the ancient people were seeing in the cosmos as plasma discharges. And they were assigning those plasma discharges to the various stories and characters that we see in the ancient gods and myths. 
you know, Tony, could it be one of these plasma discharges that maybe wiped out Mars? Because there's definitely evidence, in my opinion, for oh, some yeah. ancient civilization up there. And it appears if it wasn't some kind of nuclear catastrophe, it was obviously something that almost scorched the Earth or the Mars. Yeah, Mars shows definite um, damage that is caused by an electrical discharge or electrical arcing. Anybody who's ever done any um, welding with carbon arc rods and done arc welding will see exactly the same time, type of pitting and damage to the metal surface as you see on the surface of Mars. Exactly the same. You know, I want to go to Marty here because Marty and John, you've been awfully quiet. Me and Joe are hogging this here, Joe. <laughs> Marty, you must be listening to all of this, man. What are you making yep. of this? Absolutely great discussion tonight, guys, I must say. Um, very intellectual, a little bit over my <laughs> IQ level, but it is really, really, really good stuff. Now, you were talking about ancient gods and myths and, and religions and stuff like that. Um, as you guys know, we've got the, the fourth blood moon in the Tesrad coming up there in September. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, I do that? Uh, sorry, it was my, uh, it was my Shemitah voice. <coughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You know, uh, on the 13th of September, we do have one of these uh, partial eclipse things again. And it's actually called the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, isn't that something in religious mythology that says that there'll be trumpets playing somewhere? And then, of course, the the last blood moon coming a couple of weeks after that. I just find it kind of interesting. Winston goes to full power, just, you know. (laughs) To add to that, if we had a reconnection of one of these magnetic lines above the Earth, that would produce something called a skyquake. And guess what that'll sound like? Trumpets. Trumpets. Yeah. And we're Uh, already hearing those because of the strangelets. Isn't that interesting? You know, you, you hear people talking about the Earth ringing like a bell, um, you hear about these strange, and we've heard them because they've been they've been recorded and people posting them on YouTube and other other mediums uh, uh, of these sounds, these humming sounds. So are they you know? trying to artificially get one of these going at a time of a blood moon or something? I mean, I don't know. Are the, is there a relevance here, Tony? Yes. Because we've just seen a blood moon going by. We've seen the yep. firing up, and then as Marty brilliantly found there. Again, another blood moon, and it's going to be another experiment. Yep. Again, because if we want to call it a cult, you can call it a cult, but it's an alignment of the timing of their activities and the power levels that they're stair-stepping up towards September. Everything coincides with the alignment of planets, the energies that are derived between the planets, the magnetosphere, what's happening with our own planet itself, all of these things have to be timed perfectly with this machine. So definitely everything, as I call it, a confluence of things is pulling together right around the 23rd of September. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And of course, as we like to say here at Truth Frequency Radio, there's no such thing as dinks. So <laughs> with that said, <laughs> with that said, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes we don't understand it. But it happens for a reason. This is one of those things, you know. The, 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 the interesting thing about this particular Tetrad, as we go to break, of course, and you've heard me say this time and time again, is that it's never happened before, and it's never going to happen again. So, you know, that, that's uh, unbelievable. Hey, uh, Tony, are you able to uh, spend a little more time with us? I'm here all night if you want. <laughs> Hot damn. This is uh, fantastic. So uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, take a quick break and uh, we'll come back and we'll be more just more with Anthony Patch. I mean, this is such a great night of, of radio here at Truth Frequency Radio. And Anthony, I can't thank you enough um, for coming on and not just enriching um, our, the experience here for, for us, but also for the listeners as well, because these are the critical things that need to be talked about and discussed uh, in these days. It's a two-way street. I'm learning from you guys, too. I love to hear your perspectives because I call myself a monk for a reason. And I like to hear from you. Oh, that's great. We'll be right back, folks. Stay tuned. Much more on the other side here. Truth Frequency Radio. Real people. Real radio. Wherever you are. 
Make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Fighting for humanity and against globalism. One mind at a time. It's the Freedom Link with Joe Joseph. It's our number three of... Uh, the Freedom Link right here on Truth Frequency Radio. Well, KBS slash Freedom Link. I'm shameless. Oh, this is I've just great, man. I've kidnapped my new favorite author. I've hijacked <laughs> your show. Myself and Marty, we have it's totally well taken it. over the Truth Frequency. And the audience seem to be loving it. Yeah. And and rightfully so, guys. I mean, this is such a just a awesome topic that, you know, when you go in to explore, there's a lot of truths in this. And our special guest tonight, of course, is Anthony Patch. AnthonyPatch.com. Go there today. Check him out. Check out his books. He's also got uh, his radio, all his interviews he's got listed up there as far as when he was on, uh, upcoming events. Uh, just a fantastic uh, website. Just go check out and peruse. But, you know, uh, one of his books, uh, uh, Diamonds in the Rough, check it out. I, all of it. Just good stuff. And uh, you can hear him. Uh, on Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis as well. He's you been know, on Joe, there a few times. Before we go back to Tony, we should really thank the boffins at CERN for bringing us connections like Tony and stuff like that and all of us yeah. together because, I mean, again, pardon the pun, but we are all being pulled to this one topic right now. And I feel yeah. it is for a reason, and it's definitely time critical, Tony. These occultists that are running the show... It seems to me there's a push on to achieve whatever it is they are trying to attain. And that is why, although it might seem way out there at times, I think this is more important than digging into the false flag after false flag after false flag. Because this is big picture stuff, as you call it. Yeah, thank you. I agree. This is probably the most important topic that's out there because it's definitely going to change the planet, change our lives. I wanted to extend an offer to you, um, to your audience, and that is if you'll put out my email address or if they go to my website and use the contact tab, anybody that's listening to the program, if they email me or send me a, a note through the contact tab, I'll send the books to you for free. I'm not in this to make money. I'll send the books out through email to anybody that's listening to the program that wants it. My email address is really difficult. It's Anthony Patch, author. A U T H O R, Anthony Patch, author at gmail.com. I will personally send the books to you as PDF downloads. Well, I'm just going to paste in the link as well to the chat room. And for people listening on YouTube, we get quite a few listeners there. I will put it in the show notes. And please visit that because the book I'm reading through just now, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, absolutely, it's fascinating. I wish I had more time so I could just read it in one go, Tony, but. Some of the technology you go into in that, it's absolutely mind-blowing. But before we go on, it was, I heard you saying during your presentation about how basically this topic had brought you and Clyde in touch with each other, and there was a connection there instantly. You know, speaking to you today and then tonight, I hope the listeners are picking up on the chemistry and also the other hosts here. It is, it's almost as if we are meant to be putting this kind of information out there, Joe. And Joe's away. Yep. No, I agree with you. I have a couple of people that the Lord connected to me in about two months ago. Um, End Times Matrix News. And their conversations with me in the form of Google Hangouts are in the YouTube tab on my website. Um, we've got hours and hours and hours of conversations recorded on expanding the things that we've been talking about this evening. And I encourage people when they have the time just to go and listen to the videos, just play them in the background. They're an hour to two hours. Some of them are three hours long. And we we try to bring in all of the ancients. We also bring in the popular culture of movies and what's going on today and then the stuff that I add in. And, Tony, you really were destined to get into this kind of topics, weren't you? Because you were born right in the center of where all of this is happening today. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I didn't really want to admit that to myself, but more people have said the same thing to me that you just said. And I look back on my childhood and I look at all the people that I was surrounded with and who I, you know, communicated with. And yeah, I was right in the middle of the genome project, right in the middle of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. 
in the middle, middle of Berkeley with all of what they're doing there. There was a reason I was placed there so that I could see what was going on with their agendas and then be able to bring it to, to everybody. Now, no this, doubt. This genome project, Joe, I think this is something we should explore here because earlier on we were talking about third strands of DNA and stuff like that. Oh. Now, Tony also starts talking about how they can incorporate gold into that. Now, that could take you back to the stories of the Anunnaki. And of course they basically could. engineered us and they're lost for the gold and creating us as a worker race. And that really would make sense then in us nowadays trying to achieve, achieve the same technology, the same kind of stuff that they were playing with back then. And this genome project, Tony, and this ALS collider, whatever you want to call it, talk to us about that and this third strand of gold DNA. Yes, the, uh, the x-rays are used to create the models of the, of the proteins, the folding of the proteins, as I said earlier, so that they could determine how to take from ground zero, from a quantum level. Quantum level is what they're looking at with these x-rays. They're not seeing x-ray images. They're inferring, they're getting measurements of what quantum particles are doing using these x-rays. And they can actually manipulate quantum particles to create DNA to their liking. I mean, mm -hmm. that's starting with the building blocks, and that's why they look for the Higgs boson. That's why wow. they look for these other quantum particles, is to be able to start at the quantum level and build the DNA, and in this case, a third strand, three strands in a helical fashion. The third strand has nano thin layers of gold imparted onto the DNA so that they can um, provide digital programming that is retained in the nano gold thin layer and that programming is used to control be it a hybrid or a beast or people that are taking vaccines that have the third strand of DNA there's a video on my website about the danger of vaccines this is how they're going to create the mark of the beast is through third strand of DNA using gold. Ha! Huh. And, you know, it, and it's funny because then you get into biblical prophecy, Anthony, and, you know, as was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Um, during those times, you know, there was gene splicing and uh, mm -hmm. genetic manipulation and DNA manipulation to the point where we get a lot of the mythological creatures that we see in our storybooks like griffins and... And and um, hybrids, you know, like that. Yep. Also, all the chimera, uh, exact chimera, the the whole nine. Um, and it brings us back to um, something I've heard referred to as the Genesis six experiment. And in Genesis six, uh, it says when human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married and any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. One thing that you look at when you start going into the original trans translation of these, you know, back to the uh, original Hebrew in the Aramaic translations, the men of renown, that means men, big, big, giants, big, you know. And so the other thing, too, is, you know, then everybody's like, well, then how did they mate with them? Well, uh, they had the technology, you know. Did it necessarily have to be uh, mating uh, in the sense that we know it? Not necessarily. It happened also from uh, genetic splicing. Marty, what do, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think you guys have really hit the nail on the head there with this sort of stuff because, you know, I'm a skeptic to religion, but I do see the parallels with what's happening now and how they're meddling with science. And uh, back on, on LiveScience.com five years ago, they had an article which I just kind of pulled up there. I did actually read this quite some time ago, but it ties into what you're saying now. And uh, they, they were estimating back in 2005 that we're, we were 25 years away from actually achieving immortality oh. and in that people could actually live as long as a thousand years old and this all 
comes down to changing the human genomes and messing with the DNA and uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. And this was actually the SENS project at Cambridge University in the UK. So this stuff is going on. Not Which, Anthony, of course, we've seen also uh, Google talk about that as well. <laughs> you open up a big can of worms when you mention that name. Ah, um, I like opening up cans of worms. There's, there's another can that we should talk about, which is the adiabatic quantum computer that's related to all of what we're talking about. But to hold off on that for a moment, <laughs> um, yeah, Ray Kurzweil is the, is the front man for um, you know, Project X at Google. And he has made it very clear, because he is the PR guy, that part of Google's agenda is to have this transformation of people into spiritual entities to ascend to a higher plane of existence that we've been talking about. And so definitely they are involved in genome manipulation, um, the merging of man and machine. But man and machine is, a, is an intermediate step. The real agenda is to move to um, growing using artificial DNA. And then the next step beyond that is the ascension spiritually, taking our spirits and what we know and our thoughts and our memories and transcending physical existence right out of the DNA and into a spiritual realm. Wow. That almost sounds like, guys, you remember the original Star Trek? John King, come on, you got to chime in here. The original Star Trek, right? Movie. Uh, V'ger, remember at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, merging of man and machine? Come on, Johnny. Yes, absolutely. And if I, if I remember correctly, they have already... Uh, synthesized their first strand of DNA. Oh, Sounds yeah, good. long ago. Yes. Yeah, so it, yes. It, it wouldn't be hard for them to uh, be the creator. They could create just about anything they want. The, the, the technology that we're talking about now, they've talked about at, at lunch 20 years ago. They're, they've yeah. moved far beyond that. I mean, look at these things that are washing up on Plum Island. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. That's right. No, what, what, is, what we're seeing right now is, as I said in the beginning of the show, 30, 40, and 50 years in development, and it's still hidden from us what all that they have put together. Very interesting. And, and, and here's, here's the thing, Tony, that, that I find um, is that, okay, say we're 20 years off from the ability for them to, to say uh, that transcendence – uh, moment that you see in the movie where they're downloading consciousness onto mm -hmm. into a quantum computer or mm -hmm. or so, or something like that um, you'd have to think that at that time or before that and at least I'm praying that this is the case even though you know God says don't hasten the day um, I'm praying that he intervenes because what does that say for humanity now all of a sudden human beings you're obsolete you know that's right, and let, I, I don't like the label elite, but let's call it the elite group, whoever's at the top of the pyramid, so to speak. What they really want to do is to um, create an environment in which they can live exclusive of anyone else. And so they don't care about how many people are killed. When they talk about things like transcendence or they talk about achieving immortality or all of these cures to different diseases that supposedly they can do through the wonders of genome mapping and genetic manipulation. All of that's for public consumption. Anything that is promised to the general public is a lie. All of the promises and advances in science are withheld for the exclusive use by the elite. The rest of humanity will be left behind in the gutter. Exactly. It's like I view Google as basically the public face of DARPA. And when you look at these particle colliders, I believe it's the Department of Energy that actually runs them, Tony. Yes, oh. it is. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I got I to gotta run this by it, Tony, since he brought up DOE. Yeah. I just ran across this uh, doing some show prep. And uh, it was U.S. Department of Energy in dico.cern.ch. Specifically, they were talking about um, FCC Week 
2015, 23 to 29 March at the Marriott Georgetown. And the purpose of this meeting is to uh, basically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this has to do with future circular collider. It's not even something that's, uh, you know, it's not even on paper. I'm sure they got some some scientific calculations and all, but the this is the purpose of this meeting. It says the purpose is the emphasis of this conceptual design study is a circular hadron collider infrastructure with a center of mass collision energy of 100 tera electron volts and a luminosity of 5 to 10 times 10 to the 34 centimeters squared in a new tunnel of 80 to 100 kilometers circumference for the purpose of studying physics at the highest energies. And it said that that it could technically achieve energy up to 350 giga electron volts and luminosities. Um, basically, uh, with this other future accelerator, they want to build in the European community. So they're talking about building multiple of these things, each mm-hmm. at just exponential scales of magnitude. You That's know? That's right. That's right. The highest level that will be achieved with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN will be 25 tera electron volts when they go to the um, niobium. Um, right now, they're niobium titanium. They're going to go to ni- niobium tin comp- composite superconducting magnets. That that will only go to 25. What you're talking about is the there's the third evolution of this machine. There's another evolution of a machine they're going to build between 25 and 100. The 100 that you're speaking of is their ultimate evolution. Why do they need more machines if with this machine they're going to open a portal? That's the question. Why do they need something bigger and better? I don't know. I'd be completely candid with you. I don't know why they need two more machines that are of higher power than yeah. this LHC at 25. Especially when you consider the levels of quantum computing that they have now surely they could in the virtual model work out most of this stuff now you would think without having to go to this great expense or is that maybe part of it the military industrial complex are coining off of all of this ain't they yeah well you know you mentioned military industrial complex and that's what's behind CERN to begin with and that momentum of bigger and better, bigger and better, put in more technology, better weapons, all of that stuff, just is a, a, a snowball effect that just continues. And so these machines are really just a perpetuation of that momentum to just build bigger and better. It could be that these bigger machines are necessary to create the ultimate environment that they seek to have here with this planet um, for other beings for other entities to inhabit. They talk about creating a new race of humans to inhabit this planet. Back in the ancient times, when we talk about electric, um, the theory of the electric universe, the planet was much different. That's why we saw dinosaurs and large creatures, because we had a different atmosphere, different gravity, all of these things. So it's terraforming. Those machines, in my estimate, and again, I haven't been able to dig in deep enough to really give you a definitive answer, but it's all about terraforming. Wow. I don't wow, know Kev. I, mean, this is, I, I thought I had a question there, but then I was listening to that and my brain no, fell out again. I know, man. It happens. It, it, when you get into subjects like this, uh, John King, uh, you know, you, you, you said something earlier, I think, about time travel. Um, and you made the comment that you don't really think they've mastered the art of time travel because if they did we wouldn't be here that's right because i believe that if they did they would travel back in time to give herself the solution earlier that's very interesting i've always thought that when they actually create the first time machine here we're going to see a queue of traffic waiting to come in because i've always thought how could you return back to the future if you go to a point in the past where they haven't got the technology yet that's a good question. Yeah. Seems like a one-way yeah. trip. Yeah. And also, you know, they, especially if they have the flux capacitor technology, we already know they have the power. So, you know, the 1.21 gigawatts, they could do it. 
I've, I've remembered my <laughs> question, Joe. I've remembered this. Now, with CERN firing up and all these other ones, Tony, we spoke the other night about the possible effects on the resonance of the actual planet itself, the human resonance. Will this affect that at all? And if it does, what does that mean for life on Earth? Surely we're attuned to that frequency. Yeah, interesting. I just had a conversation about this with... Um, Tim and Chris from End Times Matrix News on our last broadcast last Thursday, and that had to do with frequency, and really our original frequency here was 432, 432 hertz, and yet everything, our instruments and and what we deal with in our frame of reference right now is not 432. It's So changing our resonance of the planet I think it's going to retune us back to 432 because that relates geometrically, arithmetically, frequency, spiritually, musically, the alignments of the planet, the model of the universe. From the micro to the macro, 432 is the resonant frequency of the planet, and they're going to terraform it and return it to that that frequency because it aligns with their physics as well as their spiritual. Isn't it interesting that it's rumored that it was the Nazis that actually skewed that 432 frequency? And when you look at the occult side of the Nazi party, Tony, and the fact that they were going to places like the Himalayas and arguably seeking Stargate technology of their own, how ironic then that we have the rise of the Fourth Reich in America and they're funding something that's going to undo the work of the Nazis that put them there. (laughs) Well, it's an extension of the Nazi technology and the work. We looked at Operation Paperclip and the foundations to NASA and the continuation of all of that. It hasn't stopped. I mean, you don't. You can take away the label of Nazi and just look at the technology. It's continued, and it's all occult-derived, starting with the Nazi Bell Project. CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, is nothing more than a large version of the Nazi Bell. Well, wasn't the Bell concerned with spinning mercury at high speed Mm -hmm. right red mercury counter rotating which is the same thing that the particles do in the hadron collider counter rotating particles wow unbelievable you know but again here's here you go this is technology that's existed for quite some time nobody has any clue and you know if everybody if, if you try to bring this up to the uh the average uh joe schmuckatelli uh john king you get looked at like uh, you got three heads. <laughs> All this, and there's three blind areas in my cell phone uh, area where I drop out. Can you believe that? <laughs> I know, isn't it? It's <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I'm I'm just uh, first of all, you know, AnthonyPatch.com is the website. Anthony Patch is the author, and he's joining us tonight. And we got a another segment to go, but I I just you know I I got to tell you I find this fascinating, especially when we start talking about. Uh, the quantum computers, the the type of technology that exists that nobody knows about. And then, you know, the, the spiritual component and also the hidden knowledge component of it. You, you can't deny it when you have places, and I got to bring this up. I got to bring up Lucifer again because this is just, uh, you know, one of, those, one of those nights where that name pops up from well, time. Well, it's according to CERN, the year of light. So. Well, right. But but also the telescope on Mount Graham, you know, yes, indeed. built on the a stargate. Telescope. Right. What do you think they're looking for? They're just trying to align the planets. People think that it's planet X and stuff like that, and it could be. It could be Wormwood returning all of that, and they're trying to track it. But I think they're just trying to get everything aligned in the heavens, and they need that telescope to make sure that their measurements are accurate because it's a binocular telescope yes absolutely that means alignments and lucifer being light and i have to refer to what kev says there about cern actually calling this the year of light 2015 because it was actually it was actually on the 20th of december 2013 that the un general assembly the 68th session actually proclaimed 2015 as the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies. And isn't it interesting that in the good book, didn't God said, let there be light, Joe? And there was. <laughs> uh, uh, yep. Yeah. 
Yes, there was. The occult mirrors everything of God. I Very interesting. So indeed. Cool. Oh, man, I mean, I'm just speechless. This is just fantastic. And, you know, uh, we're, we're going to hit the break now. I don't want to get into anything else because, good grief, you hate to be cut off by the break. But make sure you stay tuned because coming up at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific is a rundown live with Mike and Kristan and then Phoenix Rising following that. When we come back, much more with author and researcher Anthony Patch, anthonypatch.com. Check out his website. Email him. And he'll send you his books for free. And I know where this is going, folks. Do not miss this last segment. <laughs> Talk not about future oh. boo. Here we go. Buckle oh. up. Yeah. Buckle up indeed. We'll be right back after these messages. This is Truth Frequency Radio. No hate. No hype. No fear. Real people. Real radio. Welcome back to the last segment of tonight's Freedom Link Radio in association with the Kev Baker Show. It's Freaky Friday colliding with a mashup Monday at 100 terravolts, and this is the result. And, you know, <laughs> following on from this absolutely magnificent show tonight, I'm going to be welcoming on, in the continuity fashion that I love to have on KBS, Nano Girl tomorrow night. She's going to be coming on, following up from this. We'll obviously be getting into some of Anthony's work, and she's going to be bringing us her top ten Tune in tomorrow to find out. And, you know, for two and a half hours now, we have literally been peeling back the curtain and taking a look at CERN and what may or may not be going on there. Now, let's go back and have a look at some of Anthony's other work. (laughs) This really does peel back the curtain a little bit more. Hold on, let me get my bucket first so I can catch my brain. Well, I'm going (laughs) to put a warning out there for the listeners. Go and get another roll of tinfoil. Wrap yourselves up because here we go. And bear in mind everything that we're talking about here. This isn't like woo and fiction, although that's how Anthony likes to write about it to get the points across. This is real, and this is now. And you know, Anthony, one of the things I like to talk about on the show with Marty and the guys we bring on there is a program called Persons of Interest. Now, this basically deals with an artificial intelligence in a supercomputer that is God. It basically acts as God. Now, this isn't too far from the realms of reality because there are supercomputers out there right now with the potential to carry out the stuff that I'm talking about, isn't there? Yes, there are. And, you know, I want to define why I call myself a monk, and that is because I purposefully cut myself off from popular culture. I'll watch a few select movies. I have not had a television in four years. I try not to have the things that I'm connecting polluted by other people's works, including YouTube videos. So I try to come up with my own conclusions. Not that I'm special. It's just I'm trying to remain focused. And where we're going to go now is into a new type of quantum computer that is not based on transistors. We're talking about a computer based on qubits, and it is called the adiabatic quantum computer. The adiabatic quantum computer. Joe, (laughs) Marty, Johnny King, over to you guys here. (laughs) So what, uh, how does this probiotic quantum smasher work? (laughs) That's pretty good. Probiotic. I love it. Yeah. Now, we're, we're talking about a process that does not involve heat. You know the word diabetes or diabetic, and that's the breaking down of um, through calories, breaking down of foods and generating energy. So this is without energy or without temperature involvement. Again, we're talking about superconducting magnets, but we're talking about superconducting circuitry in the form of what is known as a qubit. And a qubit is not like a transistor. It's not a gate model processor. It's a CPU that operates at the quantum level. The manipulation of quantum particles at the quantum level to derive a answer that is extracted from another dimension. Oh. <sighs> wow. That almost silence. That was cool. <laughs> That's all I got <laughs> because I just got... 
Good lord, and man. And Tony, so- your, your book, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, that, that's where I came across this supercomputer. And that book in itself, it's a treasure trove of future tech that not a lot of people talk about. And some of the stuff in there, like the diamond technology that you were actually hinting at and with the submarine that's involved in that actual story. Do you want to talk about a bit of that kind of technology as well? Yeah. Diamonds are being employed uh, for the storage of digital information. And when you use a laser that is pulsing digital information, using the laser as a carrier wave, it's pulsing information into the core of a diamond and causing the carbon, C60 carbon molecules and atoms to actually rearrange into patterns that represent zeros and ones or digital information. And once that etching with a laser, if you want to call it that, takes place, that information is permanent. And as long as that diamond is intact, and it will be intact because it's the hardest naturally occurring substance, that information is permanent and you can store it forever. This can be used in a artificial brain. It can be used for artificial intelligence. It can be used for storing all of the information that mankind has, and it'll never disappear. And what are the exact on you go, Marty? I was just going to say, it's very fascinating. It almost depicted as like a hard drive, these diamonds. And you think of this being a natural thing that's been mined from the earth. What is it really there for? Some significance. Yeah, and you're right on that. I'm going to back up just a little bit because we're actually talking about nano diamonds. Diamonds that are grown from scratch. Again, starting at the quantum level, manipulating carbon and causing it to actually grow into larger diamond crystals that you can use for data storage. You can use nano diamonds as a lubricant, a thin, nano-thin um, barrier that you can put on metal objects like automobile engines or anything else. It's a lubricant that's being used today. And nano diamonds can actually be yeah. used as an artificial skin, much like my character in my book, and you can create a super soldier with an impervious skin. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, this is, and, and this is stuff that is achievable today, right, Anthony? I it's mean, this is done right now. Right. This is technology that is being put forward. Of course, we know nanotechnology has been out there for a while. Uh, we, we've got um, uh, 3D printing technology. They're talking about now, you know, wearing uh, like a, uh, what do you call it? Like the Apple uh, Watch. Instead of that, it's going to be some sort of wrap around thing. So, I mean, this technology's existed for a long time. John King. Oh my Joe. gosh, you've got a comment. <gasps> yes, you took me back. Now I'm going to take you back. Superman. Oh, Superman. Yeah. The supercomputer. Yes, he's at he's at he's at his crystal castle, and he puts that crystal down into the computer, and his mother appears. Wow! Same technology that they advertised then, that we're talking about now. When was that That's movie, right. John? Is that like the seventy seventy eight? Wow! Yep. And so I I base as I said at the beginning of our conversation almost three hours ago, everything that I talk about is taken from scientific journals. Obviously, a lot of Hollywood's been taken from scientific journals, too, <laughs> apparently. They've, they've been fed the information. They've been given the information to pre-program the public so that they will accept it. When 3D printers came out, the public didn't bat an eye because it was in science fiction. But that is the tip of the iceberg. 3D printers are being used to print using diamond nanotechnology and third-strand DNA to print human bodies today. And Tony, one of the central characters in your book, 2048 Diamonds of the Rough, get it over at anthonypatch.com, he actually is able to merge with the actual submarine and the computer. How does that happen? Where's this coming from? Because I know that that's the kind of thing that Google and we've spoke about tonight. Yeah, a couple of times tonight I have mentioned... Uh, supersymmetry and quantum entanglement. 
the quantum entanglement is the interface. That's the link of cu the communication link between the character Jim and the quantum computer that they use in the submarine and also linking to the submarine, which is grown. The submarine is alive. It's a, it's a, it's a living organism grown from nano diamonds. And he is able to communicate through quantum entanglement to the submarine and the computer back at their home base. And in that book as well, I mean, one of the brilliant bits that you managed to engineer into it was the fact that they used an earthquake off the coast of Japan to open up a natural cavity in the planet to carry out communications. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I call that through the mantle communication. And essentially, you're using neutrinos to as a carrier wave that will pass through the cracks in the Earth, but the pathway is, is determined and controlled by the quantum computer so that the signal is not interrupted. You see, these quantum computers guys are out there, and I'm wondering how much they actually run of the show as we speak. And Johnny King, you're wanting to jump in here. Yes, as it stands right now, they're developing carbon fibers that will be able to make that merger possible between the mechanical and the biomechanical. Now, you might remember uh, the story of uh, the Roswell crash, Area 51, where they said the alien beings had silver suits on and it looked like they were woven around them and it was also said that uh, they controlled the craft with their thoughts mm -hmm. taking that technology into our reality you get into an airplane and you take off and wearing a helmet and you control the plane with your thoughts the plane then becomes an extension of the self right and what you're describing are carbon nanotubes that are constructed of um, buckyballs and fullerenes arranged in a hexagonal pattern so that you have nanotubes, and these are obviously extremely small diameter tubes, but those tubes actually replace the synapses within the brain, um, the, the neural pathways connecting the synapses, and Therefore, you're able to create that connection between the brain and the machine using carbon nanotubes. That's at the nanoscale. In my book, I take that out to the macro scale and grow what I call a 600-cell tetrahedral-shaped computer consisting of carbon nanotubes that have grown out to the macro scale and operates as a computer with artificial intelligence. And, you know, just going back to what Johnny King said there about Roswell, makes you wonder, guys, if maybe, just maybe, this is the back engineering of that crash technology that we're seeing, John. Sure. Possibly, sure. just this could well be it. Yep. Johnny King, what do you think as well, man? Oh, absolutely. I, I think uh, we're getting a lot of the technology that happened from that crash. I mean, look at the, look at the progression of society and mankind. Uh, for a thousand years prior to the crash, for the last 50 years after the crash, there's been an explosion, and it's right around that time. Yep. When we're looking at UFOs and things like that, sorry, John, but when we look at them and we see them carrying out these impossible right-angle turns, they're moving at God knows what Mac of speed, and they stop immediately and turn away. Could this diamond, nano-diamond technology, Tony, could that explain that? Would we be able to manipulate that kind of things? And that begs the question... How many of these things are we looking at? And it's our technology. Yeah, I don't know how many we're looking at, but definitely um, when you talk about entities coming to visit us, exclusive of a portal, they have to have a nuts and bolts craft to be able to visit us. And they most definitely are using diamond nanotechnology to build those craft, to interface and control those craft, and be able to isolate themselves from gravity. Therefore, they're able to withstand the G-forces that ordinarily would result from right-angle turns at Mach 10 or whatever. Wow. Johnny King, any thoughts on that? Johnny King. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that it's entirely possible that to come into our dimension, they need to use a, uh, a vehicle capable of that. If, if we were to... Uh, 
fly at those speeds and turn at those angles and stop and go as quickly as they would, uh, we would not be able to survive. You would actually need a way to come up with solving the problem of objects that are in motion shall stay in motion and objects at rest shall stay at rest unless they're acted on by another force. Sort of like going down the road at 80 miles an hour and hitting a brick wall. The car stops. You don't. Yeah, definitely. Right. I mean, Marty, you were away there at the toilet. You've come back. We've been carrying on the discussion about the nano diamond technology, and I was hypothesizing possibly some of the maneuvers that we see from these crafts deemed UFOs. It's possibly the technology that they're using. And Anthony agrees that if they are traveling and machines, UFOs, they would have to have machines made of this kind of thing. And I'm keen to get you in here on this conversation and see if you've got anything else you want to extract from Tony in the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, no, that's, that's quite all right, Kev. Uh, very fascinating stuff, uh, especially when it comes to UFOs and stuff like that. Um, my take on it is that most of them are actually our own technology that they don't want to actually release to the masses or even acknowledge exists. Uh, I think there's a bit of a, an agenda with the secret tech there. But I do believe some of these crafts and some of the stuff that has been seen out in space and right here on planet Earth um, is very, very interesting. Some of the technology that you see, it, could it actually be using some of these um, uh, well, ancient gems and stones and stuff that, that's been here all along? Um, I mean, that's what the... the political elite and the, the guys that actually run these projects and stuff probably know with the uh, occult information and stuff um, but yeah, very very interesting when it comes to the UFO topic, I do think most of them are ours um, however I do think there's stuff out there I think it would be arrogant to think that we were the only existence in the whole immense universe Yeah, I, I agree there, a lot of what we're seeing in, the, in our skies here on the planet are the advanced technologies that we've been talking about um, presenting themselves. The interesting thing that I come to find, especially listening to you tonight, Anthony, and, you know, this great discussion that we're having is the fact that there's so much more to existence than we know. As a matter of fact, um, as you dive deeper down the rabbit hole, Anthony, I, I guess the biggest thing to come away from is, is that we learn... We we learn so much, but as we gain wisdom, we also learn that we don't know a whole hell of a lot about the you know our world, and more importantly, you know the universe and what makes it up. All of the different types of existence that's out there. Again, you know, our these uh this animal flesh that we have really doesn't do us justice when it comes to understanding the whole thing, and. Um, you know, as far as you're concerned, and based on, well, let me ask you this: as, as we're as we're rounding out, we get about oh ten minutes to go. What is your vision of existence? You know, through your eyes, based on your life experience and your research. Deep questions. Where, where are we going? What is what's yeah, our like, future existence see this, looking like? Where do you see this going? As far as you know, existence and everything else. Do you see that the do you see them eventually piercing that veil if they haven't already? And um, what do you think the eventual outcome is going to be? Well, I take my um, comfort and my solace and my vision of the future, so to speak, from Scripture. Yeah. And I look at the book of Revelation because I don't have any answers to anything. And I'm as confused as anybody else. So I turn to the Bible for my source of guidance and in the end, once we go through the seven years of tribulation, whether we're here or not, I won't get into that because we don't have time, but the whole thing is is that at the end of this, we will reign and live with Christ in a new heaven that's created here on earth. The machinery will go away. The pollution will go away. It will be an entirely different type of existence for us, whether we're in a human form or a spiritual form it will certainly be a completely different existence than we have any hope of even comprehending at this point. And so I just take my cues from Scripture that says it'll be a new heaven on earth. 
Well, I don't know where you take your cues from, Tony, but I have to thank you. And the reason I was keen to get you on tonight is because, dare I say it, you're just one of us. You call yourself a hobbyist monk. You're not somebody that comes from the realms of academia with a white coat on, thinking that you've been educated better than everyone else. You're a real person, and it's important to get across to the listeners out there. You know, listen to some of the stuff that Anthony's presented tonight. And this has come from a guy, just like all of you out there, who has done the digging, done the research. All of this information is out there, and we can all play a part in doing as much as Tony's doing. Just think where we would get, guys. Because oh, yeah. this is just a normal guy, one of us, just the true TFR spirit. And, and you know, what, it's one important of the things to get that across, Joe. One of the things that um, I take away from it, you know, and we get into this whenever we do our, you know, investigating. You go down the rabbit hole. What's one of the things you do? You always follow the money, right? You always yeah. follow the money because at the end of the day, you can always tell, you know, like studies. Uh, you know, uh, 20 years from now, they're going to say, why is everybody growing tumors out of their head? Well, it's probably because of all of the wireless technology and the fact that we're holding uh, RF transmitters to our heads 24-7. You know, but, yeah. of course, we haven't got down that road yet. And all of the studies out there, uh, most, most studies are funded by the same industry that's actually making them and making a ton of money on them. So the difference here being Anthony's motivation isn't money driven. It's not driven for fame. He's not looking for notoriety. He's doing it because this is the passion. This is what he loves to do. And, you know, that relentless pursuit of the truth, something that we, we all do, you know, we're not in this, uh, out of greed. That's not what this is about. This is about leave us the hell alone. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I want. I want the world back before I woke up. What the heck happened? You know? Oh God! Now tonight it's just totally. I'm. I don't know what I'm going to do <laughs> after this. Oh gosh! Because you know you think you got it all figured out, and then this. Yeah. I mean, come on. You guys uh, have been very gracious. I appreciate your kind words. I, I am just one of you. And that, and that's, that's why. why that's why. And that's, that's why I trust people like you most, Anthony. Let me tell you because your motivation doesn't come from. Greed. It doesn't come from money. It doesn't come from ambition. It doesn't come from anything like that. It's it's like uh, you know. And I I I try to tell this uh, you know to Kevin and everybody else as far as when you look at how Yeshua was when he walked the earth, he was the greatest activist to ever walk the face of the planet, hands down. Man made more change in his time and his seventy week ministry than anybody else has and done it at a time when there was no technology to do it. You know, it was all word of mouth. I mean, there's no more grassroots movement than that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so here you have the guy that says, you know, that his namesake, what did his namesake stand for? It was justice. It was uh, fr free will. It was uh, truth, honesty, courage, all of these things that he embodied. And that's what we embody here. Today, you know, because we're trying to fight against the principalities of our time, just like he did in his time. And um, that's why, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a believer. But um, I believe that, you know, there are vessels out there. We're all vessels. And God's going to use you in his own way, regardless of if you believe it or not. Because no matter what we believe isn't going to change the truth at the end of the day. Exactly, Joe. The truth is the truth, and I don't care what book it comes from, what flavor exactly. it comes from. I'll dig through it all. I don't give a damn because it's all relevant. In the end of the day, you can say it's Christian, it's Muslim, it's this, it's that. If it's information and it holds facts, it's relevant. Yes, we know that religion's out there to divide us and stuff like that. doesn't mean that it doesn't hold important answers to the questions we are seeking answers to. So don't let religion and books put you off, guys. Dig into them. Actually extract from them what we need. It's all a piece of the puzzle. That's, That's really right. what it's all about. A Anthony, any closing thoughts in the last two minutes? Yeah, I really encourage um, folks to think in terms of discernment. All of the information that we get from mainstream media, that we get from other sources, we really have to sift through it and use our own 
discernment within ourselves. For me, me personally, my discernment comes from the Holy Spirit that gives me the information I need, gives me the truth that I need. And I'm just one guy who's just trying to get along in life. And this is where it's led me. And I just hope that others will follow a similar path of exploration and, and seeking and, and find that answer in terms of what I call the Holy Spirit so that you are given that discernment to know right from wrong and to see what is really going on hidden behind the curtain and to gain that sense of freedom and that sense of um, uh, strength that you'll gain from that, from having that faith. You know, and you will have no fear of the future, and no fear at all. To see what's behind that curtain, you do need some kind of, dare I say it, otherworldly intervention, vision, whatever you want to call it. And Joe, just the other day I had to come running to you because you were my point of contact. I had a bit of a moment. I don't know if I had some kind of vision or something. But guess what it was all about? It was all about CERN. And yeah. that's why I felt it was so important to get this show in particular out tonight because what I was showing wasn't a veil being pierced or a glimpse into another dimension. I was showing what I can only describe as not another world, but a new world, another Big Bang, them almost being the gods that they are trying to emulate and outdo. I don't know where it came from. Who knows? But it was something that I've never really had before, and that's why I came to you with it, Joe. So there's a bit of woo, but personal woo from Kev before we go. And if you go to anthonypatch.com, hit the Contacts tab, Books for free, so make sure. You, yeah, make sure you do that, Anthony. Thank you so much for coming on tonight, and you know maybe we can have a discussion uh, uh, on my show in the coming weeks. Um, you know, get into the more spiritual stuff if you want, because uh, you know I'm all about that. Absolutely, the sooner the better. And you Fan- can come on KBS to get into more of the transhumanism. The but- transhumanist agenda. Definitely. Fantastic. Stay tuned for the rundown live coming up next, folks. And remember, wherever you are. Make it TFR. Good night, everybody. Then you touch that dial. Peace.